Good morning. Thank you. The April 27th, 2021 meeting of the Public Safety and Human Services Committee will come to order. It is 9.31 a.m. I'm Lisa Herbal, Chair of the Committee. Will the Clerk please call the roll? Council President Gonzalez. Present. Councilmember Lewis. Present. Councilmember Morales. Here. Councilmember Sawant. Present. And Chair Herbold. Present. Five present. Thank you so much. So on today's agenda, we will have a presentation from the executive, um, uh, specifically the executive members of the interdepartmental team on policing and community safety. We do have um, good council representation on that interdepartmental team as well, but the presentation is going to be led um, by uh, members from executive departments who are participating. We also will be having um, a presentation from central staff on the Seattle Police Department quarterly finance and staffing report. And then finally, a presentation uh, by the Human Services Department updating us on the development of its new Safe and Thriving Communities Division and the transfer of victim advocates from Seattle Police Department to HSD. Um, so the um, two, of, two of the items on um, this uh, agenda today is um, are, are focused on, I, I think, some of the really important work that um, the city, the, the council and the executive together are doing uh, towards uh, right-sizing the functions of the Seattle Police Department. So really, really appreciate getting this um, status report today. Um, and if there are no comments, I will um, approve our agenda for our committee meeting today. Hearing no comments nor objections, today's agenda is adopted. And at this time, we'll transition into public comment. I will moderate the public comment period in the following manner. Each speaker will be given two minutes to speak. I'll call on each speaker by name and in the order in which they registered on the council's website. If you've not yet registered to speak, but you would like to do so, you can sign up before the end of the public hearing by going to the council's website. The link is also listed on today's agenda. Once I call a speaker's name, you will hear a prompt. And once you've heard that prompt, you will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Again, when you hear the prompt, please remember to press star six to unmute yourself. Please begin speaking by stating your name and the item which you're addressing. And the speakers will hear a chime when you have 10 seconds left um, of your allotted time. Once you hear that chime, we ask that you begin to wrap up your public comments. Uh, if you uh, do not wrap up your comments at the end of the allotted time period, the speaker's mic will be muted after 10 seconds to allow us to hear from the next speaker. And once uh, you have completed your uh, public comment, please disconnect from the line. And if you plan to continue following the meeting, please do so via Seattle channel or the listening options listed on the agenda. There are um, 20 people signed up for public comment. Um, I mentioned that each speaker um, is allotted two minutes. We do, we are aware of a group today um, who will be uh, presenting uh, together and uh, groups of five um, get five minutes to speak. So just letting, letting folks know in advance that um, we do have that expectation. So uh, with that, Again, if no questions or comments, we'll move into public comment. Uh, the first person signed up to speak is Howard Gale. Howard, good morning. You with us, Howard? I don't see that you're muted, but we also can't hear you. And now I see you're muted. Star six, please. Not hearing you, Howard. Um, I think we'll need to move on. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
I'm we sorry. Got you now. We got you. My bad. My bad. My fault. Sorry. Okay. Good morning. Howard Gale commenting on continuing police abuse and failed accountability. Last week's verdict in the George Floyd trial was, if not justice, some small measure of accountability. But if that accountability is to have any meaning beyond the events of one day in one city, then we must all demand accountability for police killings that happened on other days in other cities and demand that systems of accountability that don't rely on a police murder becoming a national celeb cause celeb in order to achieve accountability. The other days in our city resulted in the SPD murders of Jack Kiwa Tinawin, Cody Spafford, Larry Flynn, Sam Tashira Smith, Shun Ma, Che Taylor, Michael Taylor, Charlena Lyles, Iosea Falatogo, Danny Rodriguez, Ryan Smith, Sean Lee Fur, Terry Caver, and Derek Hayden. These were mostly people of color killed by the SPD under conditions where they had only a knife, a bottle, or no weapon at all in their hand. And most were experiencing a severe mental health crisis. Every one of these murders was deemed justified. Wouldn't the absolute minimal level of accountability cause us to reconsider a police accountability system that simply rubber stamps all these murders as justified and, quote, within policy? Is your unquestioned belief that our police accountability system works resulting in an even deeper level of unaccountability? We need a civilian, we need a full civilian control of police oversight moving beyond Seattle's current system of police investigating police. It's happening in other cities in Nashville, Oakland, Portland, Oregon. Why not here? Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, in includes the uh, individuals who are um, part of a group. The first person's name uh, is Woody Zalewski. And then we also have Dale Bright. And let me see here. I'm trying to get to the names. Um, Dale, let's see. And I am not, Alex, you want to help me out here? I'm not seeing the five names. Yeah, we also have oh, Tatiana Quintana and Ben Sarcombe, and lastly, Jackson Holder. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. And so we have set the timer fi for five minutes for this group. Hello, can you hear me? Would you like yes. me to begin? Yes, please. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. Well, my name is Cody Zaleski. I'm a resident of District 4 and a medical researcher in Seattle. I'm here representing the organization Decriminalize Nature Seattle. Our group seeks to have entheogenic plant medicine be listed as the lowest law enforcement priority with protections for medical practitioners. In the wake of the Blake decision, many lawmakers on the state level are wary of pursuing more progressive drug law reform. The bill recently passed by the Senate, SB 5476, is another regressive continuation of the drug law. If the city of Seattle acts now and passes a resolution decriminalizing entheogens and protecting medical practitioners who prescribe them, we can demonstrate that there's public appetite for changing the status quo. Our organization has won the endorsement of dozens of local medical practitioners, drug law reform groups, indigenous healers, and all of the local legislative district Democrat partners within the city of Seattle that we have spoken with. Um, personally, I think the efficacy of these plant medicines in treating substance abuse, depression, PTSD, amongst others, is unparalleled, even relative to modern pharmaceutical medicine. The city of Seattle should join almost a dozen other municipal bodies, such as Washington, D.C., Oakland, and Denver, in passing these reforms. And I will pass this on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Is it, I guess that's me. I motion that we just extend this a little bit. We were under the impression that it was two minutes each. Uh, sorry for the confusion. Hey, my name is Ben Sirkham, and I live in District 3, and I'm a union organizer. I'm speaking to you all today as part of Decrim Nature Seattle in the hopes that you will adopt our resolution to decriminalize psychedelics in Seattle. My own experience with psilocybin is why I'm here today. Psilocybin shuts off the default mode of your brain that houses your ego. This is important because the negative voice that tells you you can't, you're not worthy, and you'll never overcome this quiets or disappears entirely. When I take small amounts of psilocybin, it makes me feel like my brain is finally in alignment. Mm -hmm. I'm able to think clearly about the obstacles in front of me without any distraction or self-doubt. I have been able to work through depression and even eliminate workplace anxiety, which has allowed me to excel in my career. When you want the ability to open your consciousness and have a healthy relationship with championing your insecurities, 
I'm not saying psilocybin will cure all your problems, but it sure helped me work through mine. The point is that not only are we prohibited to study and make use of entheogens for health purposes, but they're criminalized in the same classification as drugs like heroin and methamphetamine. Don't we owe it to ourselves to learn and grow from the failed drug war? There are now five other studies in one state that decriminalized the use of psychedelics. Isn't Seattle a progressive and innovative city? Why haven't we moved forward in abandoning the archaic and outdated drug laws, laws that only serve to fill prisons and ruin lives? Seattle can do better, and that's why I'm asking you to do today. I yield my time. Next speaker in the group, please. I believe that's me, Tatiana. Um, so yes, my name is Tatiana Quintana, and I'm a resident of District 2. Um, and uh, basically, one of the comments um, that I wanted to make on what it is we're trying to do is that we're looking to decriminalize um, psychedelics, particularly because of the benefits that they offer for human health and wellness. And um, if we don't take action to decriminalize growing, gathering, and gifting within our communities, then the same status quo is going to be perpetuated if we do absolutely nothing, which is um, health care that is uh, only available to people who can afford it, uh, opportunities that are mostly available to people who can afford it. And for folks who can't, they suffer for longer um, and with greater disparities. And Overdose deaths, suicide, and depression, and anxiety are all skyrocketing and especially exacerbated by COVID. Our communities deserve safe, affordable, and reliable treatments, and plant medicine is, is one of the most accessible forms of medicine because people can literally grow their medicine. Just like Seattle pioneered the way with LEAD to divert our citizens struggling with substance use disorder and other related offenses from the criminal justice system, our city and our representatives have an opportunity to be proactive and to try something different and to stand with the other communities across the nation who are trying something different. The evidence, both scientific and anecdotal, are all supportive of this. And I'm going to uh, yield the rest of my time so that um, the other folks in my group can speak. Thank you. See, we've got either um, Dale. Dale, are you with us? If not, then um, perhaps Jackson Holder. Uh, yeah, I can I can speak to him. Yeah. Um, many years ago, uh, I had a personal transfigurative experience with psilocybin mushrooms um, that relieved a period of uh, severe depression. Uh, I remember getting on the phone with my mother uh, a couple days after my experience and having her demand to know what had happened to me. You sound different, she said. You sound better. She'd been worried about me, and frankly, those worries had been justified. Uh, I hadn't had anything positive to say for months. I couldn't appreciate the world around me. I couldn't appreciate myself. I couldn't see a future. My psychological trajectory was bleak. And then uh, one autumn evening, I ate a small handful of dried mushrooms and had an experience. Thank you, Jackson, for, um, for those thoughts. Um, and if there are other comments from this group, do send them send them on. Our next speaker is uh, BJ Last. BJ? Hello, my name is BJ Last. I'm a Ballard resident and a small business owner. I'm calling Ask City Council to immediately follow through on Council President Gonzalez's budget proviso to transfer SPD's 2021 salary savings to participatory budgeting. The Q1 SPD budget and staffing report shows SPD will have between $11.5 million and $13 million of salary savings this year, which is more than enough to cover both the proviso and the $5.4 million of overtime overruns that Council pledged to take from SPD's 2021 budget. Now is the time to take action. Council can't continue to sit around and wait for the monitor to weigh in. We're already a third of the way through the year with no action being taken on this. Budget oversight is the Council's role. And participatory budgeting is the best way to create public safety. The cr police don't create public safety. It's why no one moves to a neighborhood because it has a high police presence. And the areas that with the most police presence aren't considered the safest. So participatory budgeting is the best way to do that. Uh, and also a few questions on the overtime categorizations in that Q1 staffing and uh, budget report. 
So what's the split between the overtime for protest response and events? Q1 2020 was mostly pre-COVID and had a pretty normal event schedule with New Year's and other events, while there haven't been any special events this year. So it seems like lumping those two things together is an attempt by SPD to really try to minimize the amount of spending on overtime just to respond to protests. And also, what falls under miscellaneous? That's the biggest bucket uh, without saying. So it seems like a way for SPD to hide what it's been spending all of its overtime hours on. So transfer SPD's 2021 salary savings to participatory budgeting so to create real public safety. So thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Danny Aruz. He is showing is not present, though. So we're going to move on to the next speaker. And if Danny comes back, we'll go back to Danny. Our next speaker is Hello. Oh, Danny. Is this Danny Aruz? This is Trey Thompson Wiley. You just told me to unmute. I'm sorry. I Hello, my name is, is Trayvana. Just... Trayvana, yes. <laughs> yes. I was, just, hi, about, I was is... just about to announce your name. Yes, go ahead, Trayvana. Okay. <laughs> hey, um, I'm Trayvana. I'm a resident of District 5 and a member of Black Action Coalition. I noticed that Council Member Hobel has a Black Lives Matter sign on her property. If Black Lives Matter prove it, divest from an institution that has historically brutalized and oppressed the Black community in the city. I'm a third generation Black woman here. I'm calling to ask city council to pass the original version of CD 119981 without amendment and reduce SPD budget um, by the full $5.4 million that was overspent in 2020. These funds should be allocated to participatory budgeting. SPD's overtime was used to engage in responding to protesters marching in defense of black lives, a response that is now infamous for its violence. They should not have been awarded um, violent waste of resources. We need budget police accountability. SPD has a long history of overspending and overtime. SPD has a history of overtime fraud, and so continuing to facilitate growth in its overtime budget is fiscally irresponsible in showing the black community that you simply do not care. Last year, City Council made a commitment to shift resources from SPD to community solutions. Part of this commitment was Resolution 31962, which stated City Council would not grant SPD additional funding to cover excess overtime. SPD defied this resolution by overspending overtime and asking City Council for more money. When City Council granted SPD the additional funds via Ordinance 126257, it expressed its intent to reduce SPD's 2021 budget by at least $5.4 million. City Council needs to honor its commitments to the people of Seattle and hold SPD accountable by rejecting the amendment of the CB119981 and reducing SPD's 2021 budget by the full $5.1 million and transferring that to PD. We need police accountab- we need police budget accountability now. Anything less than $5.4 million is a slap to the black community's face and showing black lives don't matter to you. If they do, prove it. Thank you, Trevana. Our next speaker is Jackson Holder. Jackson? Jackson spoke with the group. Oh, sure enough. Thank you for the reminder. Let's see. Uh, next speaker listed is Dan Otter, um, but um, I do not see Dan present. If Dan becomes present, we'll go back uh, to uh, Dan Otter to speak. But next we have Peter Vanderven. Peter? Hello. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. My name is Peter. I live in District 6, and I'm a health care provider. I've grappled with depression for my entire life and spent 30 years in and out of therapy and on medications. Therapy kept me from suicide, but I'm still depressed. My adult children also suffer from anxiety and depression and have not benefited much from conventional talk therapy and medications. I believe they and many like them should have full access to new treatments that utilize psychedelic substances. Indeed, one of my sons worked with an underground therapist last year using MDMA and really benefited from it. He was able to find an inner part of himself that he had no clue existed and used that in his regular therapy to make gains in the past year, advancing in his job and personal life. If the roadblocks to this type of therapy were removed, more people would benefit. 
without risking a prison sentence. Professionally, I often see patients whose success in managing chronic pain is impeded by anxiety, depression, and PTSD. It's hard to witness their suffering and sometimes very hard to help them. I would love to be able to refer them to a qualified therapist who could offer psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy as one of their treatment options. Decriminalizing these substances in Seattle would be an important step in this direction. Humans have used mind-altering substances for millennia. Only in the last 50 years have we been forbidden access to things that nature provides and that can benefit us psychologically and spiritually. Before they were outlawed, research showed that these substances can provide a path for healing pain, distress, and addiction. It's time to end this senseless denial. I urge the Seattle City Council to pass a resolution to decriminalize nature in our great city. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, we now have Dan Otter present. Dan? Hi, my name is Dan Otter. I'm a resident of District 6, um, speaking as a member of Decriminalized Nature Seattle, uh, to advocate that the City Council adopt our resolution to decriminalize psychedelics in Seattle. Uh, so I am a public health nurse, and my master's research uh, centered around harm reduction and safer use of substances. Um, <laughs> through that research, uh, it became quite clear that whatever potential harms any substance can cause to an individual, uh, those harms are dramatically magnified by the policies that criminalize the possession and use of that substance. Um, so our, our policies that criminalize drug possession and use are much more harmful than, than the drugs themselves. Um, and this is particularly the case with psychedelics, which uh, pose minimal health risks. They have, they have a pretty good safety profile, um, you know, compared to other illicit drugs, uh, even legal drugs like alcohol and nicotine. Um, not only are psychedelics relatively safe, but the potential they hold for the treatment of mental illness uh, is immense. And simply the improvement of people's quality of life uh, is great, uh, but criminalization um, really inhibits that potential, and we and we don't even know what that potential is because of criminalization. So, um, in closing, I'd, I'd like I'd invite all of you council members to just think about why psychedelics are criminalized. What, what's the rationale behind that, and uh, and whether those policies have uh, achieved go their goals, uh, and whether they've improved our society. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Graham Schulman. Graham? Are you with us, Graham? If you haven't already, can you hit star six? If you're still on mute. Graham, uh, yes, there you are. Thank can you, you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. No problem. Hi, everyone. My name is Graham Stolman, and I live in District 3 here in Seattle. I am here today to advocate for the decriminalization of psychedelic substances. All laws are made for a reason. Generally, good laws are made to benefit the lives of the citizens under the rule. The criminalization of drugs was not made to benefit the lives of its citizens, nor did it do so. These laws were enacted out of fear and used to oppress and criminalize specific groups of people. These substances have been more or less slandered into being considered something for delusional psychotic hippies to get high rather than substances helping functioning citizens make their lives more pleasant. My life has been more pleasant because of psychedelic substances. I've struggled with self-acceptance my whole life. As a masculine gay man growing up in today's society, I was taught to hate myself. When I first did psychedelic substances, I felt like I could admit who I was to myself for the first time. The mental blocks I had that would convince myself I wasn't who I was no longer existed, and a week after my experience, I came out as gay. On the other hand, my life has been astronomically worse because of the war on drugs. If you research the Jamie Daniels Foundation, you will find a fund for a successful man who died due to the criminalization and systemic issues around the war on drugs. Jamie was a friend of mine. Had he had access to clean, tested substances, he would likely still be with us today. The same goes for another friend of mine, Khalid, who overdosed due to cut substances as well. 
These losses I experience are part of a much bigger picture in America. Almost everyone knows someone who struggles with addiction. Ask yourself, do these fellow citizens deserve to be put behind bars? Should they be scared to go to the hospital when they overdose? Should they not have access to pure substances but score smack off the street that ends up killing them? Seattle can do better. I yield my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Des Chalfant. Des? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Des Chalfant. I'm from the Hilltop District of Tacoma. I am helping decriminalize nature Seattle in hopes of decriminalizing plant, plant medicine and making it an equal, equitable, and accessible option to all. When I was young, I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and it affects my leg muscles. It causes painful muscle spasms and consuming cannabis helps alleviate the pain. But I also live comorbidly with depression and general anxiety disorder because of the complications that arise with cerebral palsy. Consuming entheogens, psychedelics, although I am still new, have showed tremendous progress in my self-worth and my confidence. I have rekindled a passion for poetry without a critical voice and it helped make my thoughts more loving towards myself and towards others. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julia Buck. Julia? Good morning, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is Julia Buck. I'm a resident of District 6. Um, I am calling to urge the Council um, to uh, practice fiscal responsibility with regards to the Seattle Police Department's budget. Um, there is a positive correlation studied and put forth by King County that additional police overtime leads to a higher rate of incidents of police brutality. Um, the Seattle Police Department's overtime has been a source of unaccountable spending. Um, there have been uh, far fewer events in the first quarter of the year. Um, and so the uh, department's overtime spending should be able to be reduced by the 5.4 million. And that should go to participatory budgeting. Um, if police presence were correlated with safety, um, everyone in Seattle would want to live in the areas with the highest police presence. Instead, the areas with the highest police presence are considered the most dangerous. Um, and that has been a consistent um, a consistent state of affairs. Um, so please um, reduce the SPD budget by 5.4 million and send that money to participatory budgeting. Thank you so much and I yield my time. Thank you, Julia. Our next speaker is Peter Condit. Peter? Good morning, my name is Peter Condit. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a scientist small business owner and abolitionist living in District 4. <clears throat> I'm calling to remind the Public Safety and Human Services Committee that SPD brutalized protesters last year and has perpetrated decades of violence disproportionately against our black and brown neighbors, including Charlena Lyles and Sean Fuhr. The amended version of Council Bill 199981 gives SPD over $8 million for new expenditures. Those are overtime dollars and salary savings that City Council promised to community via participatory budgeting last year. Giving SPD the money back would reward them for their violent 2020 tactics and encourage more of it in the future. It is clear from Central Staff's presentation today that SPD does not need the money. They are projected to have over $11.5 million in 2021 salary savings. This means you can and should defund SPD by that amount, and they would not even feel the cut. Council should immediately move to transfer these savings to participatory budgeting, where they stand the best chance of being used to create true public safety. Council cannot sit on the sidelines and wait endlessly for the consent decree monitor to weigh in. Budget oversight is your role, and you are well within your power to transfer budget savings from SPD to participatory budgeting. Do the right thing. Black Lives Matter. I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Our next speaker is David Haynes. 
David? Thank you. Timothy Harris, or excuse me, Timothy Leary was wrong and so is drug advocates. Public safety doesn't exist anymore in Seattle. Sexual assault has become number one crisis for homeless women being predatorized by meth, crack and heroin pushers, destroying lives daily, exempted from jail by council, mayor, the police chief and prosecutor's offices. The only effort we see with council's public safety is running interference for criminals, making sure it's safe for them to make their money as if as long as they pay the rent, it's all good with bank donors owning rundown real estate and Democrats. You need a weapon or two to survive anywhere near Third Ave and the bus stops throughout the city. Yet we have 911 dispatch used by police chief as a propaganda tool to demand more money from taxpayers when they call about an emergency crisis. Then 911 dispatch refuses to send cops, instead starts finding excuses as if they're a criminal defense lawyer who took a racist professor's criminal justice class. Yesterday, a, bro a fight broke out between two competing drug-pushing prostitutes spraying large canisters of bear spray in between Pine and Pike on 3rd Ave at the bus stop, resulting in over 20 people on the sidewalk throwing up, blinded, and gagging for air. This is the same bus stop council and staff spent a million dollars breaking up, one bus stop to make three bus stops, bragging they quelled activity, criminal activity. Please resign from the council and the public safety committee. You're imploding the first world. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elena Lessing. Elena? Hello, my name is Ilana Lessing, and I'm calling in support of passing CB1119981 without amendment. I am here to demand accountability for victims of police accountability, not just for people in places like Minneapolis and other parts of the country, but for people like Charlena Lyles, Gregory, Carr, Gregory, Gregory Taylor, Derek Hayden, and countless others from Seattle. And we when we talk about defunding the police and the promises that were made over the summer, those promises now have to be followed through in this time. Move the money to for the $5.4 million to participate, participatory budgeting as opposed to funding their overtime and to keep your promises um, in terms of how they're as opposed to giving them an unlimited budget or an unlimited overtime budget. I am also here to advocate for the lead legalization of psychedelics. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you, Alana. Um, our last speaker that's um, signed up to speak is Bill Smith, but Bill is showing as not present. So I'm going to just give one more shout out for the two speakers listed as not present. One is Danny Aruz and the other is Bill Smith. Either one of those folks here, and if not, then um, we will adjourn public comment and move on to the next item um, on the agenda. Uh, will the clerk please read the item into the record, please? I'm sorry, one moment here. Agenda item number one, interdepartmental team on policing and community safety. Thank you so much. So I uh, just want to start off with, um, again, my, my thanks and gratitude for everyone gathered and the work that has been done thus far. Um, I invited the executive to brief the committee about the progress of the work to implement the mayor's policing and community safety executive order to evaluate functions and services and identify areas of Seattle Police Department response that can be transitioned to civilian or community-based responses. Um, excited uh, to have a status update uh, from, from the executive on the work of the inter interdepartmental team. I uh, want to also express my appreciation for um, the council representation on the interdepartmental team um, and uh, my colleagues on the council who um, many of the reports 
that um, we identified that we'll learn more about um, as uh, necessary as part of the budget process um, are helping to inform um, the, the work plan for that interdepartmental team. And so before we dive into uh, the presentation itself, if we could just do um, a quick go around, uh, if somebody could, people can just uh, give their name and um, their affiliation, whether or not uh, a department or an organization, uh, and then we can go back and start the presentation. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Herbold. Uh, Julie Klein here from the mayor's office, um, and uh, Dr. Chris Fisher from the Seattle Police Department. Um, I'll kick it over to him. He and I will be kicking off the presentation. Dr. Fisher, if you want to intro yourself and then maybe pass it to uh, Director Lombard. Hi, uh, Chris Fisher, Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Seattle Police Department, and I will kick it over to Director Lombard. Good morning, uh, Chair Herbold and other members of the Council. Chris Lombard, the Interim Director of the new Community Safety and Communications Center. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Lombard. We also have Sunny Wynn on the line from the Mayor's Office. Sunny? Hello, my name is Sunny Wynn. I use they, them pronouns, and I am in the Mayor's Office External Affairs team. And I'll be speaking to some of the community engagement that we've done. And then finally, we have Dr. Helfgott um, from the Seattle University. I think she was unavailable until 1030, so she'll be probably logging on momentarily. Um, and uh, she can give a quick intro when we get to her portion of the presentation, if that's all right. Great, thank you so much. Um, and the presentation um, is uh, a lengthy uh, and dense presentation. And so um, what would be helpful, I think, um, because we do want to uh, take a appropriate pauses to check to see whether or not council members um, have questions, um, but don't want to do that for every slide. So if you could signal when a section is over um, before we move on to the next section, and that I think is the will be the, uh, the appropriate time for me to check uh, with my colleagues on the committee to see whether or not they have questions about that particular section before we move on. Absolutely. All Thank right. You. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, whoops. There we go. Is that working for everyone? Perfect. Oh, okay. yes. great. All right. Um, well, thank you, Council Member, for having us on today. Um, we wanted to start off um, uh, by giving a brief overview of what we are, and I, I, I agree it's a bit of an ambitious agenda, but the things that we wanted to cover this morning. Um, so we'll be going over the community safety reimagining um, uh, work, a, a brief overview or reminder of, of what that uh, looks like and what all that entails. Um, we will briefly touch on reinvest, reinvesting in community safety services. We'll give the council some updates on the unit transfers from the Seattle Police Department. Um, we'll do a brief summary overview of the Seattle University Public Safety Survey with Dr. Helfgott. Um, do a recap of the community outreach and engagement that's gone on so far in connection with this work. Um, and then do some discussion of new models of community safety, including a very brief overview of the What Works City Sprint um, that the City of Seattle is engaging in with a large um, cohort of folks from all over the city. So um, go. I'll kick it off here by a quick reminder of the Reimagining Community Safety um, executive order that was entered in the fall um, and the timeline envisioned with that. So we are uh, there that where the red arrow is um, in towards the end of April here. Um, and below uh, it kind of lists all of the different things that are going on right now. I know you're getting a presentation from HSD later this afternoon to talk about some of the changes over there. Um, and uh, so you can see um, our, our goal is to have some uh, good recommendations and directions uh, by the time uh, the 2022 budget process is underway. Um, and so uh, we, are, um, we are behind in getting our final report done. I think we were aiming in the EO, the mayor's EO had asked that it be completed by March. Um, several pieces of that um, that are needed to finalize the report uh, from outside expert partners um, are still um, 
missing. We haven't gotten those from our um, partners yet. Um, as soon as we get those, we anticipate being able to um, finalize that report and uh, publish that and share that with council. We'd be happy to come back, um, council member Herbold, to your committee and go over that in, in a little bit more detail once that's um, wrapped up. Um, so these are the different areas that the EO had asked us, the executive order asked um, the community safety work group and also the reimagining SPD IDT, which is the more immediate work that we'll be talking about today. These are all the different areas that the EO asked us to take a look at and touch on. So um, reforms, functional transformation, community investments, and that largely lives with HSD and, the, and participatory budgeting. Um, and then fiscal transparency, um, that includes the fiscal analysis, um, minimum staffing analysis, um, and, uh, and uh, overtime revamp. All right, um, so here's kind of a list of the different items from the executive order and then related council reports um, that were requested through the 2021 budget process. Um, you can see we've got uh, monthly status report memos um, that uh, sort of corresponded with monthly staffing, overtime, and pay reports that were requested by council. Um, an SPD fiscal analysis, again, there's monthly reporting that happens on that to council as a result of the 2021 budget. The um, 911 call analysis, uh, we've engaged the National Institute of Criminal Justice Reform to uh, give us outside expert analysis on that. That is one of the items that we are awaiting um, in order to finalize the uh, report called for in the executive order. Um, we also have a preliminary SPD functional assessment, although that is sort of a, a little bit of a move, moving target um, considering the dust hasn't quite settled yet on um, SPD attrition rates. Um, and so, uh, we are going to probably have to do a little bit of an update on that in advance of uh, releasing our final report. Um, SPD workforce assessment, um, that is also including uh, some of the requirements by the consent decree. Um, that will be, and all of those things will be folded in essentially to the final report, which we are hoping now, assuming that we get um, our outside expert analysis final reports uh, soon. Um, by the end of May 2021, we hope to have that final report with all of these different aspects folded into it um, from the interdepartmental team. Okay, um, this I believe may be a graph that the council has already seen. So this uh, demonstrates the percent change from previous years, uh, budgetarily speaking. Um, you can see a huge increase in the HSD community safety investments. Um, and a decrease in the SPD budget overall. Um, so this is just to give you a flavor of uh, the net changes from uh, really 2019 as 2020 was a, 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 an odd year with the changes halfway through, but um, to give sort of a, a, an idea for the changes that have happened between 2019 and uh, this year's budget. All right. Um, I know that HSD is going to be giving a far more detailed uh, presentation to council on all of these transfers, uh, but just wanted to recap them here. Uh, we've got the transfer of the victim advocate team from SPD to over to human services division, um, the transfer budget and full time employees from the navigation team uh, to safe communities and transfer of budget for um, uh, the youth for success safety contracts to safe communities. All of those um, have been transferred out of the Seattle Police Department as well. And uh, as I indicated, for more details on uh, how those transfers are going and what that looks like, um, we uh, rely on uh, our friends in the Human Services Division and their uh, presentation that they'll be giving this afternoon to fill council in on that. Um, so now I would love to um, turn it over to Director Lombard. As council knows, there were three primary, um, there were three main civilian units or larger civilian units that were removed from the Seattle Police Department as a part of the 2021 budget. Those were uh, parking enforcement officers, um, the 911 communications center and the Office of Emergency Management. The Office of Emergency Management was already sort of functionally a standalone unit 
Um, so not a whole lot changed there. Uh, the 911 Communication Center, the, um, the CSCC as we call it now, um, has done a lot of work since the beginning of the year. And I would love to turn it over to Interim Director Chris Lombard to walk council through um, how that's going. Thank you, Julie. So excited to be giving council this update on kind of where we are. A quick little Sorry. snapshot. Dr. Lombard, can we just take a pause here? Yeah. I think this is, uh, counts as moving on to um, a different section of the presentation. So I just want to pause, see if um, any of my colleagues have questions um, about the first section of the presentation. I don't see any raised hands um, in the participants panel. Please speak up if um, I'm missing you, uh, council colleagues. I do have one question related to um, the civilianization report, and I apologize if you if you uh, covered this already. Do you have an estimated timeline for the civilianization report? Yeah, I think we're hoping all of the reports called for by the IDT in the, from the IDT, from the EO, I think those will all be rolled into uh, one that we, the final report, which we're hoping to have done by the end of May. Um, so you're making a distinction, it sounds like to me, between a report uh, requested by the IDT versus, it, are, are you making a distinction, I should say, um, the council also asked for a civilianization report. Uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm getting, I'm conflating those two, council member. I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. Um, I believe that Director Noble has a number of uh, uh, provisos and slides and reports that he may be seeking extensions on. I don't know if that's one of them or not, um, but I know that there are a number of extensions for um, different reports and requests by council. Um, that will be made soon, but I don't know if that's one of them. Okay, thanks. We'll have to follow up separately. Appreciate that. Okay, let's move on. Much appreciated. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, so, just a quick update for everybody. Uh, we continue to work on our initial size up of the operations and assessing our immediate needs. So, things included in this category would be looking at policies, uh, dispatch type codes, call processing protocols what questions are being asked, why we're doing it, uh, and what is sent. So we're trying to continue to understand the picture as it is now so that we can start looking with a direction for the future as far as how we can modify or what we can modify. And I'll talk a little bit about kind of that direction towards the end here. Uh, yesterday, we received great news. We were able to get our ORI number. The ORI number is the number that is uh, given to us by the Department of Justice and the FBI that allows us to dispatch for uh, police agencies, Seattle Police Department specifically. So now we have our own independent ORI number and are getting ready to transfer all of uh, our accounting stuff. So that was a big, uh, big success for us. Uh, we are continuing to identify and hire temporary staff to help with the transition. Uh, we have an interim deputy director helping me out, a strategic advisor. And I think the last position that we're kind of looking for is uh, some work to help us with strategic planning uh, beyond just the initial transfer. Uh, we continue to work on transferring the back end office support. Uh, so this is moving a lot of the payroll, purchasing, finance, uh, and whatnot to other city departments, moving it out of police department, trying to find new homes within the city to help support the new department with all of those important features. Uh, we've started to work with the Seattle Police Officers Guild, or the police officer, I'm sorry, um, with the dispatchers union. Uh, looking at uh, the modifications that will need to be made to their current contract. Uh, even though it expires at the end of this year, with the separation from police, there will be some modifications that need to be had. So we're starting to kind of ramp up negotiations and looking at MOU, MOA language, uh, kind of out of sequence uh, to help facilitate that relationship with the Dispatchers Guild. Some upcoming uh, items that we're continuing to work on. We continue to analyze the staffing, uh, our budget needs to uh, continue the successful transition uh, to an independent organization. Uh, again, continuing that work with, with Seattle Police Department as far as uh, pulling the, the strings apart between the two departments uh, on the finance and the budget. Uh, as Julie mentioned, we're continuing to work on a what, uh, what Works Cities Sprint. This is kind of a quick size up to see what other cities around the nation 
are doing in regards to alternatives to policing, trying to gather up uh, best practices around the country as far as how others have already gone before us in finding different needs, uh, different ways to meet citizen needs uh, that don't necessarily involve the response of a police officer yet still meet citizens' needs. So, so far some good sessions, uh, getting some good feedback on just alternatives or what's available out there. Uh, to, you know, to kind of build the, the roadblocks to see what might work here in Seattle. Uh, and then the last item that we have is uh, last week, of course, uh, Mayor's Office submitted legislation to Council on the, the parking enforcement uh, transfer legislation. So uh, awaiting to see Council's action on that. And, and that's all I have for update from the CSCC for right now. Thank you so much. And I just want to um, also, uh, you know, really say that I appreciate your uh, coming on Interim Director Lombard to uh, do this really important work. Um, as it relates specifically to um, the participation um, of the Community Safety um, uh, Communication Center in the What Works Cities Sprint, um, what what is the vision um, that you have and the executive has for um, the role that um, your department will have in the development and potential um, the potential uh, implementation of an alternative to to police dispatch. At this point, council member, what we're trying to do is we're still kind of working on our size up, you know, so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, we're, we're still trying to do size up as far as what are some best practices out there. So we've been uh, in the sprint, we've been looking some of the key cities, uh, Portland, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, were three that came to mind as far as different types of response units, different types of, of, of networks uh, that they have available. So we're trying to find out, you know, just what their what, what works for them, pros, cons, if they had to do it over, what they would what they would do differently. Uh, trying to get budgeting numbers uh, and to see kind of success rates. So at this point, we're really still just at what is out there and what are people doing and how successful is it right now uh, to help us uh, put together that plan. Uh, thank you. And just one other question. The slide says um, that um, the uh, uh, it, it reads as if the securing of an OIR, OI, ORI number is pending, but I thought I heard you say that you had secured it. Is that is that correct? Just yesterday. So we, we were putting the slides together earlier this that. week and we found okay. out just yesterday afternoon. So that's an update from the slide. Yes, we, we were able to the number yesterday. That's, that's fantastic news. Any other, um, any other questions from council members here? I'm not seeing any. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sure, gotcha. Yes, please. Yeah. I did. Sorry. For, for some reason, um, sometimes I have the raise the hand feature on Zoom and sometimes I don't. So I apologize. I know it's a little hard to see. Okay, just speak yeah, up. share you screen. Did, did perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't have a question. I just, um, I just want to, I just, um, I just want to encourage um, some sort of uh, more inclusive language as we're talking about um, these efforts, um, and and again, you know, this is this comes from my perspective of being somebody who um, came up through the immigrant rights movement and who is part of the immigrant and refugee community in our in our city. I would really like to discourage sort of the use of the of the terminology citizen um, as we are talking about who we are delivering services to. It really isn't um, just about. Uh, people born in this country, but about everybody who resides, lives, and works in the city of Seattle is uh, deserving of these public safety services. And I, and I realize that, uh, Director Lombard, you didn't intend to use um, language that would uh, exclude uh, segments of our population, but I just I just think it's really important for us to um, to make sure that we're using um, the most inclusive term. And in fact, I think the city council a few years ago uh, did revise our ordinances accordingly to strike the word citizens from our um, from many of our of our laws and replace those words with uh, resident to be more reflective of um, the realities of, of our population here in the city. Sure. Thanks. 
good reminder. Thank you. Um, one other uh, point I would love to just flag and um, Director Lombard, you and I have just discussed this. Um, I've discussed it with the mayor, but I do um, as it relates to the um, the work of the um, Community Safety and Communications Center. Um, I am so excited that um, Health One has expanded to a second unit um, very recently. Um, it has been uh, flagged for me by members of the public, um, as well as uh, Seattle Fire Department and some of my colleagues on the council, um, that there's more work to be done as it relates specifically to dispatching um, health, uh, mental health, behavioral health uh, calls to to uh to health one and health two and um just want to say affirmatively for the for the for the public record that um i'm i'm really hopeful that we can find ways um to expedite that work i i know that the number of mental health calls um behavioral health calls that um 911 takes far exceeds the, the even the additional capacity of of um, of health one and two, and it will exceed the capacity of um, health three when that ex other expansion occurs in August. But um, we, I think, need to begin to have a conversation about which calls to divert from 911 um, uh, with the understanding that we can't at this stage divert them all. Noted, yes. Member, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Lewis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just jumping in to riff a little bit off of your last comment, I, I do want to ask, as we're looking into these new response systems, one of the things in, in my personal research in this and talking to stakeholders in those other cities like Eugene and Denver is the back-end resource. It's not so much the on the ground responder that we dispatch for the mental health call, for the intravenous drug use in the doorway uh, that has a different responder that's more suited to that public health. It's having sufficient places where that person can then be diverted to to meet the underlying need. And a lot of those systems are integrated into some kind of clinic, right? Like the STAR program in Denver is integrated into, you know, sort of a version of the downtown emergency service center that they have. And of course, CAHOOTS is integrated into the Whitebird Clinic. So I sort of wonder as we're looking into this, are, are we identifying what the, uh, the back end resource uh, would be required to make the first response effective? Because I think we spend a lot of time talking about these different responses, you know, it, like how the how the teams are made up, what the background and training will be, what their approach is to engaging with folks. But I feel like we need to also be really intensely looking at our provider capacity, the institutions that we currently have to support those folks, how those response services will be integrated in to a system like that, uh, and have that really be a bigger part of the conversation. Because I think we focus a lot on sort of the uh, you know, the vehicle and the team that shows up and a little less on you know how we're going to build the capacity for those other systems which which is i think frankly our biggest deficiency we noticed that too actually council member uh early in the sprint and in conversations with john ehrenfeld with seattle fire and julie uh, the three of us reached out and recognized uh reached out to the hospital systems as well so we brought on representatives uh, from from the Swedish network, and we've actually brought on uh, Harborview as the the local trauma center and access to some of the psych psychological help as well. So yes, we we actually noticed that too, and and brought on some of those entities into the sprint. Great. Well, I, I look forward to the the report back on that. Thank you. Yeah, council member, we've gotten a really warm um, reception from some of our healthcare partners. Um, private and public health care partners and wanting to um, collaborate in solutions here. So we're pretty excited about that. All right. Anything Great, else? let's move on. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll kick it over to Dr. Fisher here um, as just a, a quick overview of um, 
uh, SPD's public safety obligations um, and to introduce uh, Dr. Helfgott. Thanks, Julie. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So as, as Julie said, this just, I'm not gonna go through the slide, but just putting it up there as a reminder of uh, you know, the overall charter obligation uh, to provide adequate police services uh, through every, in every district of the city. Um, for my, you know, I don't think anyone needs a reminder, uh, including with recent media coverage, we, we continue to be working through how do we uh, manage against an uh, uh, increasing, ever increasing number of folks leaving the department um, and how we continue to provide all of these services people expect from us uh, while we also do this work of thinking through what other resources could uh, handle some of those uh, asks from the community um, and also trying to make sure as we continue uh, in these budget discussions that we are um, keeping our spending in line, um, but also making sure that we are able to support um, activities, especially as the city continues to reopen with us. Uh, so I think the great news from the CDC today that uh, vaccinated individuals can you know, be a little bit more uh, uh, free outside. Um, so just anticipating that to continue to speed up. Um, but I will, I do think uh, Dr. Helfcott is on and I believe Julie that her, she is the next slide. Um, so we, she is going to do a brief overview of the 2020 Seattle University Public Safety Survey. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. So, um, so you want me to just get started? Sounds great. Thank you so much. Appreciate so, you being here with us. Thanks for having me. So um, as you know, um, we've been doing the Seattle Public Safety Survey every year since 2015. Um, so uh, so Julie, are you just going to do the slides for me? So yeah, you can go to the next slide and I'll just... Uh, so um, I think probably most people know about this survey, but it's part of the micro community policing initiative. We've done it since 2015. Uh, in between the surveys, we have been doing focus groups. This year, we're going to do community police dialogues from May through August. Um, and SPD has been uh, um, improving the public facing website ever since 2015. And the data driven unit now has a um, interactive public facing website where you can compare the survey findings from year to year. So we can go to the, oh, and that I should mention that the um, survey is focused on the geographical, uh, the neighborhoods. And so, uh, and, it, and I don't know of any other, other survey of its kind that collects data at the micro community level. So it collects data at the, within the all 55 uh, Seattle neighborhoods based on the idea that every neighborhood is unique in terms of their concerns about public safety. So yeah, we can go to the next slide. So yeah, we, so we've been administering this survey in 11 languages every year. You can see here the responses that we've had every year. Um, this year, we had the highest number of responses. We actually had over 14,000 responses this year. Uh, we only use the responses that identify the neighborhoods because it's focused on neighborhoods. So this year, uh, there are about 3,000 that we did not use because they didn't identify their neighborhoods, but we had 11,410 this year. Also every year, um, about 50%, usually people offer narrative comments on our open-ended question that we have at the end of the survey. And this year, over 60% um, provided the, the narrative comments. So we had 6, 000, over 6,000 narrative comments. You, this slide, you probably can't see, but, but in the reports, we have all the demographics. And I will mention here that this is a, the survey is a um, non-probability survey. So it's not a randomly sampled, but to deal with that, we uh, statistically weight the responses. So we always every year have more, say, white women in a certain the uh, mid-range, middle-age, uh, age range. Uh, but say if someone who is uh, in the 20 something age range who is a black male participates in the survey will statistically weight based on the demographics of the city. And so that uh, 20 year old black male will be get, will will have uh, his response will be uh, weighted 
you know, the, whatever uh, three times or four times the uh, the uh, people who we have way too too many of. So we statistically weight based on all of the different demographic um, variables. So we feel very confident about the results of the survey in terms of being representative of the city, given the large numbers of people that we have respond in comparison to probability surveys that we've done that have been done in Seattle that usually have six to 900 or so uh, people participating. So, so we can go to the next slide. So these are the um, top concerns. Uh, and we have questions in this survey that ask people on drop downs to identify their top concerns. So these are the, um, seven, the, the top public safety concerns uh, divided up into the nine indices um, based on those concerns. Uh, so for each year, we have the top concerns, which the data is quantitative in terms of they're just checking the uh, top concerns. And then we have the top themes, which you can go to the next slide. Uh, th so these are the top themes, and these are based on the um, narrative comments. And we always have, in, in some cases, very long narrative comments. And so we, our research assistants, our, our research analysts, our uh, Seattle University students, plow through all of the uh, qualitative comments and identify themes. So this year we had 45 themes that were grouped into 15 theme indices. And every year we look to the uh, comments. And so some years there might be new themes. I think last year there were 42 themes. This year there are 45 themes. So we can go to the next um, slide. So these are the uh, top concerns and top themes this year. So the top five public safety concerns this year were police capacity, property crime, homelessness, drugs and alcohol, and community and public safety capacity. And we did shorten last the last few years, we used the term lack of police capacity, but we just shortened it to police capacity this year. And the community and public safety capacity had to do with people saying things like, um, are, are, are uh, identifying uh, more social services were needed or more health, mental health services beyond um, uh, law enforcement. And then the uh, top most prominent themes in the narrative comments were city politics, public order crime, property crime, police capacity, and homelessness. Um, and so police capacity capacity has been consistent over the last five years, been in the top two uh, public safety uh, concerns, but homelessness has been rising up uh, year to year and um, drugs and alcohol, I don't believe was in the last or in the top uh, public safety concerns in the past five years. We've never had city politics in the top five narrative themes. And of course this year it rose to the, the top. Um, if you look at the scale responses, one of the other unique things about this survey is that we have um, these scale, the scales in the survey that measure aspects of quality of life in neighborhoods. So we ask people to rate on a zero to 100 point scale on their uh, um, sets of questions that are uh, measuring these concepts of police legitimacy, uh, social cohesion, informal social control, social disorganization, fear of and uh, fear of crime. So this shows that the police legitimacy rating was 58.4 um, this year. It, it was ve very, very slightly down from last year. Um, uh, informal social control was down from last year and social disorganization was a little bit up from uh, last year, but uh, otherwise they're, rel they're relatively um, stable from uh, last year. And you can see the mean scale responses over time um, on the, uh, graph to the to the right. We also ask about people's views of um, policing, uh, of, of, of Seattle police, and also the, the United uh, police in the United States generally. And every year, Seattle police are related uh, rated a little bit higher than uh, United uh, police in the United States. So you can see the rating fifty three in Seattle versus fifty on the hundred point scale in the United States generally. So I can go to the next slide. And if you have questions as I go, feel free to um, ask questions. I just, um, this slide just shows citywide in comparison to the different precincts. So of course, every year, different precincts have had different, slightly different uh, concerns. Um, you know, the, if you look, say at the East precinct, uh, police legitimacy was the top uh, theme in the East precinct. 
um, which was different than uh, uh, Seattle citywide. If you look at the North Precinct, homelessness rose to the top of the top public safety uh, concerns. Um, and, of course, and homelessness was also one of the, the themes, as was city politics. Um, if you look at the uh, South Precinct, city politics uh, was at the top, but violent crime was also one of the themes, which we didn't see in the top five and some of the other uh, precincts. Um, we always, every year, traffic safety is in the top, uh, usually in the top five in Southwest. It continued to be in the uh, top five uh, this year. Um, and you can see in the West Precinct, homelessness was at the, the top. So just shows some of the differences um, in the different precincts. Can you um, just remind me, what, what is the difference between um, police capacity and community and public safety capacity? Yeah, that's a good uh, question. So police capacity has to do with people saying, there's, there's a number of um, uh, drop downs that people can select, like I want more police in the neighborhood or sl uh, slow, slow police response, want police to come faster. Uh, so those would be the police capacity ones. The community public safety capacity have to do with um, wanting more social, we need more social services in the neighborhoods, need more mental health services in the neighborhoods. So not police, other social services in the city. Thank you. So we can go to the next um, slide. I know I only have a few, 10 minutes, so I'm going fast. So, if you, uh, so this just shows the, um, the different scale responses citywide. So let me see what's the most notable here to, to mention. I guess one of the most notable things to mention is the difference in the police legitimacy ratings. So for example, if you look at East Precinct police legitimacy ratings, it was 50.4 on a 100 point scale. If you look at West Precinct, um, it's 64.7 on the uh, so there's a, a pretty big span in terms of police legitimacy ratings, with the lowest being east um, and the highest being west and also um, southwest. Um, let's see what so the, the other thing you might look at is just the social disorganization ratings, you know, which which range from the low of what 36 in the southwest um, to the high of uh, 51 in the, the West. So it just it gives you a, a way to look at these different um, uh, scales with respect to different aspects of uh, public safety across the city. Dr. Health, it looks like Council Member Lewis may have a question. Oh, I didn't see. Okay. Then, I know. Or did let's you want to wait, Council Member? Yeah, I'm let's sorry. just wait till we finish oh. the section and then we can go back to the appropriate slides. Okay. With, and I have other slides. If you have, yeah, so, so, yeah, so I just, you know, I brought, I, I put this slide in just to show there's just some interesting things. We didn't have this in the actual public facing report, but there's some interesting things we saw based on demographics. Um, we are, we're actually planning to do an academic article on the more deeper dive of these uh, um, findings, but um, we did find a linear relationship between age and ratings of police legitimacy. If you take out the 90 plus, we only had about nine people in the 90 plus group, but if you look between um, 20 to 89, that as a person gets older, the higher the ratings of police legitimacy. So the people in the lower under 20 age uh, category had the lowest rating of police legitimacy. And we have the weighted and unweighted here, but if you use the weighted, it's 23 on a 100 point scale for um, people age under 20 as compared to the 80 to 89 group was 78.5. So that's quite a big span of ratings of police legitimacy. The other interesting finding here is that the BIPOC um, groups in the um, uh, respondents in the, the survey rated police legitimacy higher than the um, white respondents. And, and, and the range is the 57.5 for white respondents. And if you look at black respondents, African-American black was 61.3. Um, and, and similar to the other um, BIPOC groups. And then if you look at gender, the, uh, it's a, the males rated police legitimacy higher, 63.2, as compared to females, 57.2. Uh, um, and then the lowest was the transgender and um, people who didn't identify a gender, which was 36.2 and 40.9. So you can go to the next. Um, so yeah, this just shows the different um, scale ratings over time. 
Uh, so just a different way of looking at the different scale ratings by precincts. And uh, I don't need to go into this, but just this just gives an example of how the survey findings can be used. So if you want, if a, um, the police department or any city official wanted to go into the survey and look at what's the difference between you know different neighborhoods in a precinct in terms of their um, perceptions of quality of life, their perceptions of top concerns. So this shows two um, neighborhoods in the South Precinct, Hillman City and Soto that had the lowest and the highest police legitimacy rating citywide uh, in one precinct. So Hillman City had the lowest um, rating of police legitimacy at 36.2, and Soto had the highest at 77.8. Um, so it's just uh, uh, interesting to see just the, the differences, you know, across the different neighborhoods within one precinct. Um, and similarly, they have, you know, differences in terms of the top concerns and the um, prominent themes. So you can go to the next one. I think I have a, um, oh, so and this, the, I don't know if you want me to go into this, the differences, do, do we have time or we, we can stop here. If we, you do want me to keep going? If, if you've got uh, another slide. Yeah, I have a few more slides. These are just examples. So th this is an example of social disorganization ratings, which gives a good idea about how people feel about their surroundings and the uh, graffiti and open air drug activity and littering and things like uh, that. So the social, the lowest social disorganization rating in the city um, was Sandpoint and the highest social disorganization in the city was uh, Pioneer Square. And so you can look at that in relation also to the um, top concerns and themes, which in Sandpoint was uh, top concern, uh, police capacity, property crime in Pioneer Square, top concerns, homelessness and, and public order crime. Um, and then, so yeah, you can go to the next slide. So this is the informal social control. Informal social control has to do with the degree to which people are willing to um, call the police or, or join a block watch, you know, be a block watch captain and, you know, take responsibility for what's going on in their neighborhood. Um, so these are the lowest and highest ratings of social, informal social control. Uh, so Pioneer Square, 27.6 as compared to Magnolia, which is 57.3. Um, uh, and again, you can look at that in relation to the top concerns and the top um, themes where again, homelessness, public order, crime associated with sort of that unwillingness or a, maybe a feeling of helplessness of not, you know, doing anything, uh, taking ownership to do anything about it as compared to um, in a community like our neighborhood like Mag Magnolia, where their top concerns are police capacity and city politics. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. Social cohesion has to do with the degree to which people feel they know their neighbors and they have a you know tight community. The lowest ratings of social cohesion is, uh, were in Soto at 39, highest was in Sandpoint. And again, looking at that in relation to the top concerns and themes were in Soto, it was homelessness and city politics and uh, Sandpoint was police capacity and, and property crime. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. Oh, so I did want to highlight, so we're doing this year something different than we've done before. As I said before, we've done focus groups every year in between the administration of the survey. We've done the focus groups just so we have a more real-time way of collecting information about people's concerns. Um, but this year we wanted to do dialogues. We've had people in the community ask in the past, can we have police at these meetings to talk about the, um, you know, the survey results and to talk about our concerns. So this year um, we're doing a reach out for the community and a reach out internally to SPD uh, for volunteers to participate in these community police dialogues. And the idea is to do them with a restorative uh, framework where there can be a dialogue regarding the uh, findings in the survey specifically, but also if other people have, if people have real time issues uh, that they want to discuss with the police. So, um, so yeah, and then I just wanted to do a shout out to all the research assistants. You know, we have every year this uh, five, six 
uh, graduate and undergraduate research uh, analysts who work on this project. We've had 29 research analysts uh, to date who have participated as, um, you know, uh, doing the research on this project. And most of them, uh, now that they've, when they've graduated, they've gone into law enforcement with SPD, FBI, other agencies um, locally. So I just wanted to thank them for all their work uh, uh, on the, and, and this year we had Caitlin Yep, uh, Alex Borsky, Sierra Loveness, Rachel Deckard, and Jane Park. So, so yeah, that's it. And if you have any questions, I think the next slide has my contact information and uh, also my colleague, uh, Dr. Will Parkin, uh, he and I do the survey um, together every year with the research analysts. So yeah, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Perfect, thank you so much for this overview and I uh, really appreciate your uh, condensing the presentation. Uh, Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to ask a clarification. If we go back and look at the themes, like the, the themes people were responding to, if you can go back in the slide deck, further back, I should remember what, uh, what slide it was on. Yeah, I guess here. So the, the city politics theme, like what does that exactly entail? Is that sort of just like a narrative of like, you know, we can't, get along as a council and a mayor or is that like you know like what does that mean when people are saying that when it comes up in here is it just like it, a general perception of dysfunction or it's we actually did ratings drilled down we had um sub sub theme sub codes where we had um like for example i mean people called out city council people call out people by name and we don't of course have any of that deep dive in the but we code we actually had city council positive city council negative it was overwhelmingly negative on the city and we just put anybody that said anything about city politics were obstructing public safety and we have gotten that every year some of that but this year it was a lot more than we've seen before and some people you know, had very long responses. So it was anything where, whether they said the city council or, or they said other city politicians, or if they generally said um, politics and polit uh, were getting in the way of public safety. All right, thanks for clarifying that. Um, on that note, sir, um, I, I remember that there was um, a mention that and I might be wrong, so correct me if I am, that there was, that you saw more evidence of the survey being shared on social media this year than in past years, is, is that true? And well, are there are there any um, any outcomes that you speculate might, might have resulted by that, from that? No, I don't think it was any more than, I, I don't know that I said, that we, we've done the same outreach every year where our RAs do administration, uh, survey administration through all the precincts, including social media, Facebook, blah, but but the one thing that was different this year is I was actually chat, what I, I'm not good at the Twitter, thing, but I have t Twitter and I was tagged and, and contacted directly by, um, actually called and tagged and contacted directly by um, some people involved in the protest, um, you know, pro defunding, and we're spreading the, uh, the survey around on social media. So that was, I mean, there was nothing different on our end. We always try to improve our outreach through all different social media, but there was active, you know, was, is it tagging? Is it adding me? I, I don't know what it's, but there was people that were, you know, actively talking about it in, in social media. So. That, that, that's helpful to understand. Thank you. On, on, and I'd say on both sides, it wasn't, you know, it was on both sides. <laughs> right, right. And that, that was, um, that was my, my question is whether or not the distribution of the survey on social media, not by yourselves, but by other actors, um, whether or not there was any attempt to evaluate the impact um, of that on the, uh, the, the outcomes of the of the survey we did we 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 were a little we didn't um we, you know we were concerned that somebody would want like 
you know, I try to bot the survey, you know, have, 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 you know, a whole bunch of people take it. And so we are able to go in and we can see if the same person. So we did a lot of cross checking to, uh, on that. And because of the number and the nature of the narrative comments, we have, we can have a high degree of confidence uh, in the um, people that we kept in, you know, in the um, responses that are kept in and the ones that were kicked out. So if the same person with the same law, you know, the, um, the same number uh, responded to the survey and they didn't have any comments, we can see when someone tries to take it over and over again, I guess is what I'm saying. So, so yes, the, the answer to your question was yes, we're able to, to, to see that. Thank you. Councilman Morales, did I see you raise your hand? Yeah, I'm interested in learning a little bit more about your engagement process. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that um, you consistently have more white women taking the survey, which uh, seems to me a, a reason to change up the way you do outreach. Um, if you're not, if you're not, um, you know, getting a more a more representative or more diverse. Um, uh, response. So can you, you mentioned social media, but can you talk about other ways in which you are um, trying to get folks to engage with this survey? Yeah, sure. And, and we do change it every year. I mean, we try to improve it every year and we, we've done everything from, you know, uh, reaching out to, we didn't, this year we did that a little bit differently, but we, we've even done uh, paper flyers out to the Seattle public schools that go out to all the parents um, we, we do the survey administration. We couldn't this year because of COVID, but we did contact the Downtown Emergency Service Center and ask them to get the word out through the unhoused uh, persons. Uh, but we've actually administered the survey in uh, Downtown Emergency Service Center in Southwest Precinct and downtown. Uh, we go to, we have, we plaster the uh, flyers citywide. We have little business cards and flyers and we, we're out at dog parks, Starbucks, um, you know, uh, uh, the Seattle Public Library. But but did, given with COVID this year, we did plaster the flyers, but uh, we, we had even a more elaborate reach out plan on the email list. So we, uh, nursing homes, the shag homes, we, all, all the different community uh, organization, uh, uh, community um, uh, centers. And so we, it's, it's a, it's a very elaborate reach out um, email list and uh, social media list for each precinct. So, you know, one of the issues with the white, more white women, I mean, I think more white women completes, I mean, in a middle age range, completes surveys in general. It's not just our survey. And we've done everything we possibly can to, to do that um, outreach, in, including the languages. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I agree. We would love to continue to improve on the outreach. Um, we also, the, uh, of course, the, our RAs go to the different, you know, the African American Advisory Councils, the different community council um, meetings. So uh, we've gone before to the Not This Time group to, to you know, reach out. And, and so we try, in the, that's the responsibility of the RA in each precinct to identify community groups from all different communities within each community to try to get the word out on the survey. The RAs will go, and I've many times gone to uh, speak in, in groups. We try to get the word out through uh, the uh, media, different media outlets. So that's, okay. yeah. And you mentioned as well that um, you will be doing a paper on, one of my questions was on um, how disaggregated um, by race and age these, results are um, so will you can you talk about when you will be making that available well we're, you know takes quite a while to get uh, from start to finish to get the article published but yeah we're working right now to try i think that's we have several articles that get to a deeper dive on the um you know the, the findings that we were also thinking of doing an article on the responses on the protest versus the defunding issue just because that really rose to the top this year and all the comments but um probably uh, from i don't know when it will be published but we're working on it right now and we should have the actual article done over the next few months but then it, the yeah. publication process will probably take a few months Thank you. Um, 
given that um, that this is an annual survey um, and a appreciate um, the work that goes into this every year. Um, I have in past years and will likely do so again this year, uh, promote um, promote the, the outcomes. Um, I also let readers of my newsletter know about the, the, the survey tool um, as, you're, as you're doing the work out in the field. But um, I'm just interested to understand, um, again, given that this is an annual survey um, and that this has been identified for us today as an input to the city's work um, around um, uh, identifying functions for, um, for uh, non-uniformed uh, policing as part of this sort of the broader uh, reducing the footprint of the, the of the police department uh, and the other the other tasks in the um, in the uh, interdepartmental team um, executive order. How how does this information fit into that? And maybe that's a question for Julie. Yeah, I think that's a question for myself potentially or Dr. Fisher. And I think. Um, I think it all feeds into um, you know, our sort of basic understanding that, that public opinion is not a monolith. Um, it does vary by neighborhood. It varies within neighborhoods. Um, I think uh, we are uh, probably not formal. We, well, we, we, obviously this survey has significant value, um, but it's only one piece of the community engagement that we're doing. Um, and next up will be Sunny who will walk us through um, other aspects of community engagement um, surrounding this work, but um, I think the longevity of this survey and the, the number of years they've been doing it and its reach um, is super helpful for us in understanding, you know, what different aspects of the neighborhood perceive as primary issues. Um, that will be important in our analysis of, um, you know, ultimately, you know, what types of alternate response models we should be exploring. So I think, um, and, and where they should be placed or where they should be concentrated. Okay. Thank you. I'm not seeing any um, further questions from council members. So yes, let's, let's move on to Sunny. Okay, Sunny, let me get to your slide here. Awesome, all right. Um, so I'll start by uh, echoing what Julie just said that like we, we have all of this like great uh, sources of data that are coming in, including um, some of the neighborhood public safety surveys, like the CID, Ballard, Soto have their own uh, annual public safety surveys that we're also considering in this engagement work. Um, but uh, the main goals of our engagement for this specific IDT process was one, to demystify SPD's budget, and I, I won't just read the slides to you, um, you have that information there, but also uh, to really talk specifically about SPD um, because there's already a lot of great work going on about what to stand up outside of SPD and how do we expand our community safety network. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't undermining that research and that work and really focusing in on the department itself. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. Uh, and so we're doing that in a few different ways. Um, uh, so the first thing that we started doing was reaching out to our city boards and commissions. These are folks that council and uh, the exec have worked to put into our city system to give us this exact kind of feedback, right? Um, so we met with the uh, 10 uh, boards and commissions. And the major themes that we got from those conversations are that, well, first one was uh, that as we move things out of SPD, we really need to make sure that they are being set up for success and that we're not just doing budget magic, right? We're not just saying we're taking the dollars from SPDs this function to put somewhere else, but that we're actually reimagining them as we do that to make sure that uh, we are creating deep change. Um, and that uh, several commissions mentioned that they wanted officers trained further in cultural competency and humility, disabilities, and nonviolent tactics of de-escalation, and that they wanted to see the types of training that they're receiving shift, that they um, want to see like community-led training as well as that like professional training that uh, SPD already receives. And finally, remove SPD's presence in the navigation team, which the council did great work on already. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, we've also been conducting a lot of listening sessions and focus groups. Um, so some of the ones that we've done are listed on the left, but I wanna name that 
um, this work is not done yet. And I don't think there is a point where we can say like, we've done enough outreach on a conversation like this, right? So we're gonna keep doing listening sessions and focus groups and community engagement up until we submit that final report. And even after that, we're gonna need as a city to keep those conversations moving as well, of course. Uh, but our major themes from the different community, uh, community listening sessions that we've had so far uh, is that uh, folks are concerned about, again, that the transfer of civilian units um, and making sure that we're not building additional bureaucracy that damages their efficacy, but that we're really setting them up for success again. And um, that, they wanted to see opportunities for those new entries into the community safety system to collaborate with SPD's current system uh, if and how they choose uh, so that we're really building integrative community safety networks and not distinctly parallel like this is the SPD track and this is the like social work track but that these th these systems are working together to really uh, build up a true community safety system. And uh, just to finish off, like I said, we have to keep continue, continuing this work beyond the final report, of course. Um, but we're going to keep doing some more listening sessions, particularly with uh, some of our labor partners. And as you know, we're waiting on some expert reports to come through. And we really want to make sure that we're bringing that to the community as well, right? Um, part of the RSJI principles that we're incorporating into our work is that we're coming back to the conversation over and over again with our community partners as new information comes to light for us. Um, so that's a quick down and dirty on the community engagement that we've been doing so far. Thank you, Sunny. Um, just looking to see whether or not I have any virtual hand or real hands raised here. Not, not seeing any. Um, so this is, again, this is really, really helpful. Do we have a, a wrap up here? Let me unmute myself. We do. Um, and I know that council has seen this as well um, uh, already, but just a reminder, these are some of the, the national partners we're working with when it comes to functional analysis and looking at new models of community safety. Um, and then we, we included a few slides just um, for awareness. I know council is well aware as many council are involved in the What Works City Sprint that we're participating in which is an eight week program um, where uh, it sort of walks us through and, and um, helps us, helps to facilitate the city in um, exploring alternate emergency response models and what might work for Seattle using lessons learned and information from other cities. So um, we have a, a very uh, broad cohort in the city of Seattle, a lot of people interested in being involved in this conversation. This is a non-exhaustive list. We have added additional members um, to the Seattle cohort, um, meaning the folks that call in for each of these um, uh, sessions. Um, and this is a sort of a, just a general overview of what all the different sessions are. Um, and, and that's the wrap up. So uh, I will stop there and we're available to answer any questions pertaining to anything on here. Great, thank you. Um, really, I just wanna thank you uh, for making it possible for uh, so many of um, not just internal stakeholders to participate in the What Works City Sprint, but also our external partners. I'm finding as a participant um, that it is, um, that there are a lot of, for, for the other cities, there are a lot of voices external to to government that are that are participating, and it's really important that um, that we hear their perspectives in other cities and and in in our own as well. So um, I think that was um, you know go, going broad is is super super useful to I think our our end product. Um, just looking to see whether or not there are any other questions. I see none. Um, so again, thank you so much. Thank you for having us, Councilmember Herbold. And let us, um, once our uh, our IDT report is finalized, we'll be happy to come back and walk through that with you. Look forward to it. Thank you. Will the clerk please read agenda item number two into the record? Agenda item number two, Seattle Police Department quarterly finance and staffing reports. Thank you very much. So we have with us Greg Doss and Allie Panucci of Council Central Staff. The Council um, has made ongoing budget requests to SPD and after consulting um, with Central Staff, 
quarterly reports um, seem like to be the most productive approach for updating council members. Um, many of these reports are um, reports that we receive monthly. Um, and so uh, really appreciate the work of uh, Greg Doss and Ellie Panucci in, in finding a way to, uh, to transmit that information to us in a way that is um, efficient and um, hopefully will be uh, effective to our efforts to, um, to uh, scrutinize the Seattle Police Department budget. Um, so before I, I turn it over, I just want to, um, again, uh, opening remark that uh, the 2021 Seattle Police Department hiring plan is fully funded in the budget that is adopted by the council in November. Um, just again, uh, as this as this discussion um, um, is, um, you know, I think intrinsic to, to part of this discussion um, is the challenges um, associated with reduced staffing. Um, and so given that that is going to be reflected, that reality is reflected throughout um, these reports. Um, I think it's really important as a level level setting um, effort that, um, again, the council fully funded the um, 2021 hiring plan during the budget process. With that, let's turn it, turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning and good morning, committee members. Um, as the as our chair just said, I will be presenting to you the quarter one SPD budget and staffing report, and there is a lot of information. We've got about 25 slides. I'm going to uh, to try to go through it as quickly as I can, but it's in some ways kind of um, data intensive, and so um, I'd ask that you jump up and and um, either virtually or 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 just verbally let me know if you have a question because I may not be able to see it. Um, and so, Ali, would you mind uh, flipping to the first slide? So we're going to cover four areas today. Uh, each one of these areas is guided by a council statement of legislative intent. I'm going to go over them quickly here. The first one, uh, SPD 001A003, is on financial reporting. The council had requested monthly financial reports that uh, were quite extensive, went over various budget categories, um, and uh, also on excess pay, uh, excess pay meaning pay that is received over $150,000 and a request for pretty much every single expenditure that SPD makes. And uh, we're going to go into a number of these uh, data uh, today. We will not be going into excess pay reporting because we're mostly focus focusing on the first quarter. Um, we're not uh, getting to the point where many folks in SPD will be approaching $150,000 in um, compensation, uh, with the exception of command staff and some civilians. Uh, it's the case where overtime plays into um, uh, compensation for officers, and we're awfully early in the year to be able to tell how that's um, progressing. So that one we're not going to touch on today. We're not going to touch too deeply on uh, every single financial expenditure. Um, there are well over a thousand um, in the first quarter. Uh, what I would mention is that council members have uh, voiced some interest in expenditures that are being made around, um, oh, say, body armor, weapons, things that, that might be classified as militarization. Uh, there is a demilitarization SLY response that the uh, department will be sending in the next month, and hopefully that will cover many of the questions uh, about SPD's expenditures in those areas. And if it does not, then that, that's something that the committee can dive into later. But uh, given all the things we have to cover today, uh, we're not going to move into that area. Uh, the second thing we will cover will be use of overtime. And uh, the third thing we will cover will be staffing. And when we go into staffing, we're going to go all the way down into the um, uh, all the way down into the precinct staffing and 911 response. And then the fourth thing we're going to cover is going to be response time. And as well as response time, we're going to be looking at uh, priority call responses, um, a, a way that SPD is trying to triage, if you will, its uh, 911 responses. Uh, so that they can, as best as they can, maintain uh, quality 911 response times. So if there are any questions on that slide and what we'll be covering, um, please shout out. Otherwise, I will move in to the presentation. 
Okay, so we're going to start out with finance monitoring. And we'll start out with the biggest expenditures. Uh, council members are probably used to me hearing used to hearing me talk about how uh, the budget is pretty much all salary benefits, overtime, and allocated costs. And so here again is a reminder that that is pretty much the case. Uh, what this slide is showing is uh, the largest expenditures, those three, and then it is showing the difference between the first quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021. And as you can see at sort of a high level, spending has gone down by about 11% from last year, which is fairly significant. Um, the other big picture takeaway from this slide is that uh, overtime has halved. Uh, well, it was about 8% of expenditures this time last year, and um, this year it is 4%. There is, of course, uh, a pandemic going on now that was not going on in January and February of last year. And so that, that is, is some of the reason that that uh, piece has gone down, but it's not the only reason. And so as we dive a little deeper into overtime uh, later on, you'll see that. So um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. So the next slide is, um, basically the, the larger expenditures and how they are looking against budget. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, on this left-hand side of the screen, the 2020 adopted budget at Q1. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you're seeing 2021. And so this gives you, um, this gives you a picture of what the department is spending in these areas and then also how that's measuring up against the budget. And uh, you know, what I would note is that um, it would be really easy to say, well, this is a quarterly budget, therefore everything that uh, the department is spending right now should be about 25% of their total budgets. Um, not necessarily true with SPD for two reasons. The first is that uh, an, a lot of SPD's work is seasonal. And so when we talk about overtime, Overtime is not something that they should really be at 25% uh, of at this point in time of the year, because uh, that's something that, that is really bulks up over the summertime. Um, and then even something as similar or as simple as salary and benefits, you would think salary and benefits would be something that would be easily divisible by uh, four for 25%. But in this case, uh, not true the city's um, pay cycles are such that through March, actually we would expect that SPD would have spent about 27% of its budget on salary and benefits. And so why is that important? Because the fact that they've only spent 25% of their budget on salary and benefits shows that there is uh, salary savings. And as we get further into the into the uh, presentation, we're going to be talking about um, that salary savings. And so, um, um, as I said earlier, I just the last thing on this slide is that, uh, as you can see, that overtime is about half of what it was um, last year. And if there are no questions on this slide, I will keep motoring through. Okay. So the next slide is, uh, shows at a high level all of the other expenditures that SPD is uh, making throughout the year. And here again, we're talking about a very low percentage of the budget. Um, the big three categories making up 90, 96 or 97 percent of expenditures here we're talking about everything else being a whopping 3 percent or 4 percent of expenditures. And here we have a variety of categories that uh, I think the council is mostly familiar with from the budget exercises last summer, but I'll, I'll hit them at a high level. Um, what, you've seen, what you see before you is uh, services, consultant, legal, and other is, is the second category. Um, well, I'll go ahead and start with separation pay. Separation pay is exactly what you think it is. It is uh, the uh, pay that the department uh, provides to officers who have separated or are leaving service. This is um, compensation that the officers are owed when their vacation is, comp is, is uh, paid out or their or comp time is paid out. And um, as, as I think most folks are aware, there have been a large number of officers that have left the department recently. And that's why you can see the difference between Q1 of 2020 and Q1 of 2021. Separation pay is uh, a significant 
expenditure for the department at this point in time. So, and, and we will be diving into that as well. But uh, really quickly on the other categories, just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, the services consultant, legal and other category, that orange category, those are mostly contracts for service that SPD has. Um, the largest one being the city's red light cameras. And that's well over half of that entire category. Uh, the other charges, which is the one at the very bottom, that's the green category. That pays for things like building rentals, um, such as the OPA office or evidence warehouse. It also pays for things like fuel. Um, the entire budget for uh, other charges, not very big. It's about 1.2% of the entire adopted budget. So um, again, not a large area. Discretionary purchases is that light blue area. Discretionary purchases is pretty much everything else. Discretionary purchase is used to, do, to buy uniforms, guns, office supplies, even water that is supplied to officers when they're working special events. Uh, here again, that particular slice of the entire budget is, is really small. It's a little over a percent. And then uh, travel and training is pretty much just what it sounds like. That one, um, that one is budgeted at about 900000 for the entire year, so uh, less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So if there are any questions on that, please let me know, and I will move on to the next slide. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So what you're seeing here is a breakdown of how those uh, expenditures look against the budget. Um, again, on the left-hand side, you see Q1 of 2020, and the right is Q1 of 2021. Separation pay, not so good. Um, separation pay was budgeted this year at 898,000. And as you can see, the separation pay through the first quarter is already up to 1.5 million. Um, that's, that's the only area that is running over budget. Everything else is relatively under budget. Um, capital is a bit of an anomaly. Capital is, is uh, expenditures around things like IT. You would think an agency like SPD doesn't have any capital, and that's largely true. We're talking about $6,000 of, of things that just get categorized as IT or other things that might fall into a capital description but, but aren't you know, brick and mortar. Um, but as you see the other areas, uh, discretionary purchases, other charges, pretty much everything is down um, compared, to, uh, compared to 2020. One of the reasons that that's significant, not just is it down numerically, as you can see, say discretionary purchases is, is down um, 876, it's at 876,000. Last year it was 981,000. So uh, it's down numerically. Um, you know, what's important to note here is that these categories received uh, many of them reductions in the adopted budget. So the fact that SPD is running, um, is running under budget, uh, they're running under a budget that was reduced. And so um, that is their attempt to be good fiscal stewards. So if there are no questions on that one, I'm going a lot faster than I thought I was going to. Uh, let's move to overtime. All right, so as we just, as I discussed a moment ago, overtime spending is down considerably in 2021. It's about half of what it was uh, last year. In this chart, what you can see is the first quarter of 2021 compared with the first quarter of 2019 and the first quarter of 2020. And these are the uh, smaller um, uh, overtime expenditure areas. And here we're measuring in hours, not in dollars. Um, and what you can see is that, once again, overtime is down, as you would expect, uh, in just about every single area. Um, it is disproportionately down in some areas, like criminal investigations. You can see when comparing against uh, 2019 or 2020, um, it's like half, a little, little more than half, way down. Um, you can see that against uh, the miscellaneous category in uh, 2021 and 2020, it is um, tiny. Now, uh, 
I think there was a question during public testimony about what's in that miscellaneous category. And what's in the miscellaneous category here in the um, presentation, not a lot. There are uh, emphasis patrols, which um, the city uh, had funded at a, at a higher level in 2020. And the department uh, used a lot of emphasis hours in 2020 uh, in the first quarter because that's when the shooting happened on, on Pike and Pine in the Pike and Pine area. And so that's why that green uh, 2020 bar is so high. Um, and this year uh, in the 2021 budget, um, emphasis patrols were largely defunded. And so there's, there's not really any spending or use of hours uh, there. Other categories in uh, miscellaneous are say mayor's security um, and then uh, court. So, um, and, and both of those are, are relatively small categories compared to um, all the other overtime categories. So hopefully that demystifies a bit what's in that miscellaneous category. Thank you. Um, I, I do have one other question uh, that was prompted from uh, from public comment. Uh, appreciate you anticipating uh, the question about the miscellaneous category. Um, there was a comment about the SPD overtime during the first quarter of 2021 compared to 2020 and 2019 in the chart regarding uh, the categories that are lower, uh, specifically events, uh, which includes demonstrations. Um, and the the um, the public comment noted that the first quarter of 2020 was before large scale protests. Um, can you? provide a little context for this and what we can expect to see in future quarterly reports? Yeah, so um, let's go ahead and move to that slide then. That's the next one. And so uh, what you're seeing here is overtime hours broken down by or, or three uh, categories that are actually typically larger, but these are um, uh, particularly interesting because these are areas that are, are affected by the pandemic. These are areas that are um, of council interest, uh, as you mentioned, uh, spending or of use of hours around um, demonstrations. And so I think what you're talking about, council member Herbold, is the, the, um, the middle um, area that says events, including Seattle Center. And what's, um, what's notable about this is that the department classifies these hours as events but they include demonstration expenditures. And so what you're seeing here is that in 2021, there were um, hours used for demonstrations uh, and um, not for events. There were obviously in, in 2021, no events that, that SPD had to staff because of the pandemic, but that gray bar pretty much exclusively um, represents, uh, represents demonstrations. There were um, I think $17,000 or so was spent for a snow event, but um, all in all, it's that area was for demonstrations and it adds up to, I believe, about $345,000 that gray bar. Is that uh, getting at your question? Absolutely is. Thank you. Okay. So um, the other thing that I would point out about uh, overtime hours in these three areas is that patrol operations is up. Uh, in 2021, that is the only area of overtime spending uh, or overtime use, in this case hours, that is up anywhere in the department. Uh, it was also quite high last year. Um, as it turns out, uh, 911 response across these three years, uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021, the number of officers doesn't change a lot. And we're going to get into that um, a little bit later, but uh, deployable staff, meaning the number of folks that show up uh, and can be deployed, um, that is something that is a little different these days than, than in prior years. And so that may be partially what's driving that, that overtime use there. It, and it may also be other factors um, that uh, standards that the, risk, that the department is putting into place. That's uh, something we'll get into a little bit later. Shall I move on? Please. All right, so SPD staffing. Okay, so um, 
uh, SPD does not uh, provide uh, projections anymore in its staffing reports. Um, historically, SPD has provided staffing reports that show actuals to date, and then they project anywhere between one to two years out. Um, and historically, it's been pretty predictable about how many folks would come into SPD, be hired in, and how many folks would separate. Um, that is not at all predictable now. Um, it is, it is uh, something that the department feels very uncomfortable about projecting. And so they uh, are at this point sending to the council only actuals. Greg, um, is, that, is that for both new hires and separations that they're not doing projections? It is, it is for both. Um, can, you, can you remind me that if, um, if they're not projecting separations upon what is the separation pay budget based on? I would, I, I would have to answer that for you later. Okay. Uh, my my uh, speculation, and I'll reserve the right for the department to correct me, is that it's based on historical levels of separation. Um, but okay. that's something, that's something that uh, I will um, I will get back to you on. All right. Thank you. And so. Um, Without the department providing any projections, uh, it's difficult to know how the staffing uh, picture will look throughout the year. And so uh, in the past, the council has asked central staff to do its best job to um, do some predicting about how staffing will look. And that is what I have done again. Uh, I have put together a staffing plan that assumes actuals, or it doesn't assume, it, it reflects actuals from um, uh, January through March, the first quarter, and then going forward from April to December, uh, I make assumptions about hires and separations. Specifically, I'm assuming that there are going to be about eight hires per month. Um, that is consistent with uh, some of the higher levels of staffing uh, hiring that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, particularly 2019 comes to mind, uh, eight hires per month um, would be uh, originally consistent with what the department thought it was going to be able to do this year. Um, get into a little bit more detail on that later. Uh, the uh, forecast that I'm putting out there also assumes that there are going to be an average of about nine separations per month. Um, that is a little bit higher than uh, what we have seen in SPD in the past. When I say in the past, I mean pre-summer 2020. Um, usually officers left somewhere around uh, the pace of about seven per month. Um, of course, now, um, as we know, in the fall, and as you'll see, continuing into the first quarter, um, they're leaving at well more than twice that rate. And so we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, the, the average of nine separations per month that was picked and the average of eight hires per month that was picked for my assumptions reflect um, the council's staffing plan, uh, which council member Herbold said is uh, fully funded. That is described in SPD 025B002. Um, their, their hiring plan completely funded. And so um, I just took the completely funded hiring plan and um, I subbed in the actuals for the first three months and made projections from there. Hopefully that, that makes sense. So move on to the next slide. So looking at the first quarter, what it means that I took actuals and I, um, um, sub that in is that there were 52 trained officers that left in the first quarter and there were 58 total separations. The difference between the 58 and the 52 are that some officers that were in training or some recruits dropped out. And so that's, that's why we see some difference there, but um, we're seeing a total separations of, of 58. So when we talk about seven per month or nine per month, obviously, you know, you can see in the big picture context, when we're talking about 58 in three months, um, obviously nine is low and seven is, is 
very low uh, in terms of historic averages. Uh, on the hiring side, uh, you can see that there were 30 hires made in the first quarter. Um, that is because there were uh, a number of uh, folks that were um, either hired or in the hiring process. And last year in the fall when the academy shut down due to the pandemic or over the summer and SPD stopped hiring, they sort of banked a number of those recruits. And by doing so in January, when they started hiring again and sending to the academy, they had a bit of a backlog and uh, there were 21 folks that were ready to go. They organized with the Washington State Training Academy, a Seattle only class and sent all 21. At the time that uh, the forecast was being put together, the, the council forecast and, and the forecast that central staff did, we knew that those 21 were gonna, were gonna happen in January. And so they were assumed uh, in the hiring plan. Nothing, uh, nothing significant there. And as you can see, and in the lines, I think you've seen this, this graph before, the top one is fully trained officers. And there you're seeing the number of officers that could be deployed because they have exited the student officer ranks and can answer 911 calls on their own. Uh, the second line you're seeing is officers in service. Uh, those are the number of officers that can be deployed um, and the difference uh, are able to be deployed. And the difference between the two is uh, that uh, there were about 118 on average over the first quarter officers that were out on long-term leave, either a, a disability leave, an administrative leave, a family leave, uh, and so those 110 officers that were out uh, are not deployable. And so when the department is looking to uh, figure out what its street strength is, if you will, it's, it's gonna look more to that gray line than it is to the, uh, to the blue line. Um, so with, I'll ask if there's any questions on that before I move on. Okay, so I'll go that ahead. That number of officers is, um, is decreasing. Uh, the, the number of officers who are um, fully trained but not in service. It, it went from one or 1094 to 1090. So it got a little worse in Q1, but the department, this is an area that the department is giving us projections on. And so they are- um, Oh, I see. <laughs> Those the, are, that's projected out to the fourth quarter. Yeah, so as we move from the first quarter all the way into the fourth quarter, you'll see that that number will um, get a little better. Uh, there will be fewer officers out on disability leave or administrative leave. That is the department's belief. And that projection is based on their knowledge of the amount of time um, officers um, are out? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. It, Yes, that's it. So they know, they know officer, officer A is going to be out for a month and officer B is going to be out for three months. And they, so they're able to provide this projection based on some actual information about the individual uh, um, instances of officers taking leave. Yeah, and they, they provide some of that data to us. We know that there are about 30%, like 29% that are out on workers' comp issues. There's about 45% that are out on um, sort of a general category of a sick or accrued benefits. And there's about 18% that are out on administrative leave. So to the extent that they, um, that they know when those particular kinds of leaves will end, that they, um, they can predict or project uh, how that in-service line is going to look. Okay. Thank you. All right, moving along. Go to the next uh, slide on SPD staffing. And so um, what does all this mean from a money perspective? Um, obviously it is uh, probably big news that 58 officers left in the first quarter. Um, it does have quite the financial impact on the department. What it means is that at the very highest level, the average annual FTE, which is the funding for officers student officers, recruits, every, every, every sworn or, or near term sworn, soon to be sworn uh, uh, officer uh, is in that line. 
It was originally funded at 1343 in the adopted budget. It is, if you look at the central staff estimate, um, again, assuming about nine folks will leave per month um, for the rest of the year, and assuming that there'll be about eight hires for the rest of the year per month, then we would expect that the FTE, average annual FTE is going to get down to about 1251. So that is about 92 positions fewer than are funded in the adopted budget. When I say positions, I say FTE. It's about 92 FTE fewer than are funded in the adopted budget. And so what that means is that um, if the uh, projections that I've made are accurate, um, at the end of the year, the department will have about 13 million in salary savings. Um, if you wanted to take a really conservative look and you go back to historical separations and you say, okay, maybe it's gonna be seven per month um, instead of the, the nine average that I'm projecting, um, then you can lower that salary savings down to about uh, 11.5 million. I thought I would provide a range uh, to give folks um, uh, an idea about how the money would work between assuming seven separations or, or nine separations as, as the analysis assumes. Um, if, uh, if we wind up in this situation, the city, then at the end of um, the year, you'll find uh, fully trained officers at 1176. Officers in service will be at uh, 1,110. Both those numbers are on that graph you just saw. And as projected out, the hiring will wind up being 102 officers not 114. Um, the, uh, the department was only able to hire uh, four officers in each of the last two months um, in terms of new recruits. So they're running behind, um, probably not going to make the 114 uh, unless they exceed my projection of eight per month. And they might, um, there's a possibility they could bring in a lot of laterals um, and, and do that, um, but it would be, um, it, it wouldn't be uh, something that the department had done before. Their highest uh, level of recruitment was 105 in, in, in 2019. So um, it would be difficult for them to exceed that without really changing the way that they're doing hiring. And then my assumed separations, given the 58 that are uh, showing in Q1 and the nine that I assume on average throughout the rest of the year, we could see 142 separations by the end of the year. So I'll ask if there's any questions on that. And of course, here again, I wanna emphasize that, that the council funded 114 hires. And so if the agency is able to do that, the money is there. In fact, the money is more than there given the number of separations that, that they have seen um, in the first quarter. All right. Uh, Chair Herbold, I think Councilmember Morales may have a question. Yes, thank you, Ms. Alley. Um, so I just want to um, reiterate what I think you said, Greg, which is that um, while this slide at first glance looks like um, there's 13 million in salary savings due to um, separations, um, that's assuming that the rate of separations and new hires continues through the year. So that that's what would accrue by year end. That's not available right now. That is correct. That that is what accru would accrue by year end. That is not available right now. Um, and I think what we would have to see is that um, the uh, separations would have to really go down to reach nine per month, because as I say, there were 58 in total, um, 52 fully trained officers, 58 in total for the first um, three month. So it's got to go down, um, you know, from almost 20 down to nine um, to be able to, uh, and if it doesn't, if it stays at the levels it's at now, then um, you're going to see more than 13 million uh, by the end of the year. Okay, so move along and show what this might mean on the ground. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about precinct staffing. 
and uh, you've seen this table many times. This is uh, basically 911 officers broken down by uh, the various precincts. Uh, citywide is, is a category that uh, the department is using to sort of fill in um, where, uh, where additional officers are needed in these various precincts. Uh, what's important about this particular um, slide, and I'll get into this a little bit more in a moment, is that you really you really only see 911 officers here. You, you can see that there are three other categories, beat, Seattle Center, and Station Master. Seattle Center and Station Matter, I would, I would uh, Station Master, I would consider more of security or support roles. Um, Beats, uh, you've got 11 officers here. Um, what you're not seeing here is the anti-crime team or the community police team. Uh, historically, there were in this table 34 anti-crime team officers, uh, 28 uh, community police team officers, and that beat number was at about 51. And when I say historically, I mean, if you look back at the beginning of 2020, you'd see those officers. And uh, of course, what happened is, is as as the um, as officers started separating, the chief had to move folks from those specialty sort of proactive positions into 911 response to be able to keep um, 911 response times down. So go ahead and flip to the next slide. This gives you some perspective for what I'm talking about. What you see here is um, on the left-hand side, the dates. These are point in time, um, August 2020, uh, September 2020, December and March over basically the last six months or so. And uh, the next column, total precinct staffing. This, this is a column that represents what was there, everything in terms of um, 911 officers, precincts, support, CPT, ACT, um, everything is in that number. So if you're, you're looking at the first column here, what you can see is that the uh, total precinct staffing was 677. And of that number, there were uh, 495 officers that were responding to 911 calls and there were 68 sergeants that were supervising those officers that were responding to 911 calls. And so um, what you see as we start to move through time into September, December, and March is that um, the uh, precinct staffing number is, 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 is going down. Um, the 911 officer number is generally holding fairly constant. There was a, a massive bump between August and September, and that is when the chief transferred in all of those CPT act and support officers um, into 911 response, and uh, some about 17 officers from, from outside of, of uh, precinct support. And so that beefed up that uh, number to 591, which is the highest that, that uh, 911 response has been in a long time. It has, for the last year and a half, uh, been more at the uh, 495. In fact, it goes back to down to 466 if you look at 2019 when we're talking about officers for 911 response. So the chief bumped it up to 591. And um, what that had the effect of doing was to uh, provide more resource for 911 calls. But then as the attrition started happening uh, from September moving forward, um, officers started leaving uh, the department and that started to affect precinct staffing. So as that happened, you can see the precinct number starts going down. The chief is doing his best to hold, um, to hold 911 response officers at about the 500 level. Um, and as we reach March, 2021, you can see that pretty much the only thing that's left of total precinct staffing is the 911 response. So I know that's a lot of information. I'm gonna stop and, and ask for questions. Yeah, I have a, I have a question here. Um, is there a correlation or do we know if there's a correlation? Um, is it possible to know whether or not um, the attrition since September is attributable to the transfer from specialty units into into 911, is there, um, is, for, 
Is there a higher percentage, for instance, of officers that that have left that are are officers that have been transferred? Uh, that isn't something I know. Uh, it's it's uh, something I'll I'll ask the department and get back to you on. Um, they they have been keeping track of some of that information, so I'll I'll get back to you and let you know. Um, the my my recollection is that that it was a mix of older and newer officers. Mm -hmm. um, that it wasn't necessarily all um, experienced officers that that were leaving, and so um, it, it is likely that that some of the folks that left were actually in nine one one response or 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 non specialty patrol. Uh, but I will um, I will uh, let you know more later. Thank you. Any other questions on that? Okay, so how is this translating into service? Uh, priority call responses. Priority call handling, I think you've heard a little bit about from the department. This is a situation where uh, SPD believes that it is, uh, it doesn't have sufficient staffing levels to be able to uh, answer um, all uh, 911 calls. And so a commander makes the decision that they are going to um, prioritize or to emphasize uh, calls and to tell some folks that they're not going to come out, that they're going to um, come out at a later time, or that callers, more specifically, callers should call back at a later time. And so, um, you know, what I would highlight here is if you look at uh, the description on the right hand side, um, Starting at about number three, communications will not dispatch to um, narcotic activity, burglar alarms, um, priority three or priority four calls, or uh, calls that require uh, only an officer to show up for a report. If someone calls 911 for those things, then they'll be uh, under number four, they'll be told to call back at, at another time when staffing can be present. And so the, um, the department keeps track of the number of times that these things happen. And the graph on the left shows that uh, the number of times that they've had to go to priority response has been increasing. Um, one thing I should note is that the 2021 number is a year to date number. It is not first quarter. Uh, it is through April 22nd. Um, the other thing I would note is that it would not be accurate to take that number and just do a straight line projection with it throughout the year uh, and try to estimate what would happen at the end of 2021. And that's because 911 calls and a lot of the work that SPD does is seasonal. Um, and, and obviously we're, um, we're at their quieter time of the year, if you will. Um, quietest probably being through the holidays, I'd have to ask Dr. Fisher, but um, anyways, point being, you can't take the 84 and just uh, figure out what re remaining days are and do the math and, and find the number there. Okay, move on. And what you're seeing here is the 911 response times that the department has provided. Um, as you can see, it went up by, um, all response times have gone up since um, uh, 2019. Um, with the exception, I believe, of South. And um, that went slightly down um, from 2020 to 2021 in the first quarter. This is apples to apples. So we're only looking at Q1 of, um, of uh, this year compared with Q1 of 2020 and 2019. But other than that, they, they, these calls have generally gone up uh, across the board and everything is up on priority two. Um, and just for context, the goal for priority one is seven minutes, and um, I believe for priority two, it's, is it 15? Priority two is totally escaping me. I'm going to have to get back to you on, on that one. Uh, I, believe you're, I believe you're correct on, um, it, it had been seven minutes, yes, on priority one. Um, I will get back to you on, on both of those. Thank you. So the next thing I want to cover now that we're through uh, most of the um, reports that SPD sent is the provisos that the council has uh, has enacted on SPD 
The reason this being important is because um, this affects SPD's finances and their ability to use their budget uh, as the council provides those restrict the budget for a number of different purposes. And I'm just going to remind the committee of, of what those restrictions are. Um, start with slide number 20. Um, as you can see, the first uh, proviso here is the out of order layoff proviso. This particular proviso is two and a half million dollars. And the idea here was that this money is being held out of SPD's budget. Um, they cannot spend the appropriation until authorized by a future ordinance. Um, and the idea being that the city is pursuing uh, a potential of having officers who have been uh, accused of misconduct and found uh, sustained misconduct, um, uh, potentially having those officers uh, be uh, prioritized for a layoff. Um, that is something that is, uh, if it ultimately doesn't come to fruition, will be something that the council could consider uh, restoring that two and a half million dollars. Um, move on to the second one. The second one is a salary savings proviso. Uh, the council rightly anticipated that uh, due to the um, uh, number of folks that were separating from SPD that there would be salary savings. Uh, and so there is a proviso that holds $5 million uh, that says that uh, that money can't be spent until future ordinance. Um, and that uh, the council established an intent in that proviso to transfer some funding to finance general so that it could be used for participatory budgeting. Um, you'll see the last line of that uh, proviso says, as any such transfer or transfers are made, the council will adjust accordingly the spending restriction imposed by that proviso. And so that's another $5 million that the department has to not plan on having. And then uh, switch to the number three, which is a Harbor Patrol proviso. This was just holding 550,000 aside. Um, the council prioritized a report on what Harbor functions might be um, transferable either to the fire department or the new community safety and communication center. And as long as, uh, as long as that report is submitted to the council, hopefully by uh, the due date of May 24th, then the council could consider restoring that money into SPD's budget. The last one is the travel and training proviso, and that one holds up about 700,000 of funding for travel and training. Um, what's notable there is that the entire travel and training budget is only about 900,000. So that's holding um, a large chunk of the travel and training budget. Um, when I say travel and training, I should, I should note this isn't uh, training for um, de-escalation or, or officer skills. That, that kind of training is, is in professional standards. Um, this is more uh, professional or certification kind of training including the kinds of things that civilians might go to um, or certification things that officers might go to, but not, not the kind of um, uh, training that is mandated by the consent decree. That stuff is, is all in a different area. Um, and so as long as the department submits the report on travel and training, um, then this, this one will self-release. The council will not have to act again um, hopefully that happens soon. Uh, the report was supposed to be due on March 31st. I think that um, the mayor's office in the last presentation said that that was coming soon. So the um, travel training proviso self-releases, but the Harbor Patrol proviso uh, requires action by the council? Correct. And the um, salary savings proviso, um, the $5 million salary savings proviso, can you remind me um, how we propose to address that in um, the um, budget reduction bill that um, we've been discussing in committee? In the amendment that uh, you proposed, Chair, and that the committee um, uh, voted to replace the original bill, I should note that that amendment hasn't been voted out yet, but Correct. Uh, that, that amendment uh, would essentially release the um, salary savings proviso. Um, it, it does require that the uh, department send, um, continue to send staffing reports, but it would essentially release the $5 million hold. 
as long as the department sent staffing reports. Pending the, the continuation of the um, sending of the staffing reports. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And so summarize uh, key takeaways. Um, the first one seems obvious, staffing is a challenge. Um, uh, I went into a bit of detail with um, uh, the precincts because I wanted to point out that the biggest change there has been that SPD has lost its proactive patrol positions. Uh, 911 response has not changed a lot, as you can see in the data, but ACT and CPT have been pretty much eliminated. Uh, beat officers that were at about 51 are now down to 11. Um, the department would say that the staffing challenges are contributing to priority call handling occurrences those being uh, trending upwards. And um, as we know, the, the uh, higher separations uh, continue. Um, nearly every category of overtime and discretionary spending is down compared to 2020. I think we know that the exceptions are patrol augmentation and separation pay. Uh, what's notable, I think, is that everything else is down um, in many cases uh, numerically, meaning spending was less than fewer dollars than last year. And I think as the council knows, the budget was also lower. And so um, in many instances, the percentage spending as a percentage of budget is also down. So this is, um, you know, the department is, is doing what they can to be good fiscal stewards and adhere to the, um, the council's budget. Um, Number three, salary savings may reach 13 million. We talked uh, fairly extensively about the uh, assumptions that central staff have made that would uh, require getting to third or, or would, would have to come to fruition to be able to get to 13 million in 2021. Um, I, I would note that uh, the department has said that the salary savings is something that they would like to rely on for fixing the separation pay budget issue, uh, some new civilian positions that they're interested in and technology investments, all of which um, are um, recognized and would be funded with salary savings under the um, amendment that the public safety uh, committee has chosen to substitute for council bill 119981. Um, and the city council has also interest, indicated an interest in uh, recouping some of those salary savings for participatory budgeting. That also would happen under that, under that amendment that I just spoke to. And then lastly, um, the provisos that I went through are holding about 8.5 million of uh, expenditure authority that the department would uh, ultimately need to have restored if they were to be able to use their entire budgets. So have covered a lot. Um, with that, I'll ask if there are any questions. I am not seeing virtual hands or real hands. Um, this is uh, very helpful and timely. Um, as context, I think, for considering um, the SPD budget reduction bill that um, aims to both uh, align with um, our commitment to um, reducing $2021 um, uh, to uh, address the, um, the overspend of overtime in 2020, but also working to fund um, the shared priorities that council has with SPD for, for some of these salary savings. And so I think this is this, um, even though uh, we um, had to pause uh, in the deliberations of, of that bill because um, of the need to um, uh, allow the monitor to receive uh, responses to the questions it had asked of SPD, um, this uh, the the use of this analysis as um, during the time of of that pause, I think, is going to serve us well when we take that bill back up again. So, with that, I um, I say thanks again. Thank you, and uh, really appreciate it. Um, Clerk, can you please read the final item into the agenda? 
Agenda item number three, Human Services Department update on safe and thriving communities and victim advocate transfer. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, really uh, appreciate being joined here uh, by the Human Services Department. Um, Want to just maybe ask uh, Amy, did you want to do uh, a quick a quick intro to orient us to to the presentation? Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Amy Gore from Council Central Staff. Um, the final item on the agenda is a presentation on the Safe and Thriving Communities Division at the Human Services Department. Um, you'll recall uh, that this is a new division that was established in the 2021 budget. Um, as mentioned earlier today, this division includes community safety programs and the Mayor's Office on Domestic Violence, which have been traditionally housed in the Human Services Department, as well as the Crime Victims Advocates and Victim Support Team, which were transferred to HSD from Seattle Police. Um, today, the um, HSD is going to speak to the new division and the status of those transfers. And with that, I will transfer, or sorry, I will turn it over to Tanya Kim. Thank you. And I'm assuming that uh, Lily is going to pull up the slide deck. Um, great. And so uh, I'm Tanya Kim, Interim Deputy Director of the Human Services Department. Hi, and I'm Dana Lockhart, uh, manager of the Crime Survivor Services Unit in the Human Services Department. Great, thank you. So I'm going to, I know that we are uh, short on time, and so uh, forgive me if I'm rushing through some items, always happy to come back. Uh, today, um, we are going to provide an overview of HSD's Safe and Thriving Communities Division. And then Dana, my colleague you just met, will do a deeper dive on the Crime Survivor Services Unit that was transferred over uh, to us from the Seattle Police Department. Uh, next. And one more. Okay, <laughs> HSD has four divisions. Uh, we have our leadership and administration, aging and disability services, youth and family empowerment, and homelessness strategy and investments, of course, which is transitioning over to the Regional Homelessness Authority. The new Safe and Thriving Communities Division consolidates HSD's existing safety efforts and includes the Crime Survivor Services Unit. There'll be approximately 30 staff. And like other divisions within HSD, it'll function as a funder, a direct service provider, and a convener. We're in the process of standing up the division, and one of the first orders of business is hiring our division director, and that posting is live. Uh, and we hope to have the position, uh, the person, uh, in place um, at the end of May, if not June. Next. There are three distinct units within the safety division. Um, the first being community safety uh, investments, which is responsible for the request for proposals and contracts with community-based organizations uh, who support youth, uh, adults, and families harmed by the criminal legal system. And so you'll see our community safety investments in that unit. We have our mayor's office on domestic violence and sexual assault, who serves as a funder and a convener. Um, they focus on gender-based violence services and support uh, survivors who are at risk of gender-based violence with community-based services to support and maintain their safety. And MODVSA uh, also leads the coordination of the city's response to gender-based violence. And then finally, we have the, uh, the excuse me, the Crime Survivor Services uh, Unit, which my colleague Dana will describe uh, later on in this presentation. Um, briefly, wanted to highlight uh, the contracts that we will have in the in the division. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I just have um, as it relates to your description of the um, uh, community safety investments. Um, it says uh, that they support youth, adults, and families harmed by the criminal legal system um, through various supports and services. Um, and we've 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 talked about these investments. Um, this is an area um, where we've uh, the council, together with the executive, have worked to increase um, these investments. But doesn't this category also include investments meant to create safety before exposure to the criminal legal system as well? Yes. If the outcomes of the performance measures um, uh, are tied to community safety, yes. 
uh, but you know, with the Human Services Department, we also have the Youth and Family Empowerment Division, and that's really going upstream and creating those conditions of of well-being and so you know youth development and you know um, food food and nutrition etc that's in that division and so it just depends on what you mean by before <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay yep. um and so moving to uh the next slide i did want to give a quick preview of uh the contracts that do exist and this might help articulate it a little bit uh with a finer point too is that um in the community safety we it's in that unit that you're um, pointing out to a uh, council member is about $22 million of investments. And that does include um, the recent council ads. Uh, and it also includes the active community safety capacity building RFP that's in progress. And we'll circle back and give a presentation on, on that um, once, once that RFP is done. And there is about 9.4 million in gender-based violence there. And so together, those will be the investments uh, that we have uh, within the division. Uh, and so with that, um, we want to uh, do a deeper dive on the Crime Survivor Services Unit. And uh, I'm gonna in reintroduce Dana to take over. lost my mute button <laughs> um thank you and now i've lost my notes oh darn it uh too many too many screens yeah <laughs> too many screens too many screens and now it's locked behind my uh notes i apologize i'm gonna look up one more thing here we go All right. uh thank you tanya so the creation of the crime survivors is Crime Survivor Services Unit uh, does align with the City of Seattle's commitment to reimagine public safety. Um, as you know, Council passed legislation in August of last year that transferred all of the victim advocacy services out of the Seattle Police Department. Our unit serves crime survivors of 11 different person-to-person -person crime types. That is domestic violence, elder abuse, sexual assault, child abuse, internet crimes against children, commercial sexual exploitation of children, human trafficking, robbery, hate crimes, assault, and homicide. And while we are creating a singular unit for all victim advocacy services, it is our intent to continue to maintain specialized professional expertise in the specific complex trauma needs of each crime type. Uh, crime victim advocates will remain co-located within the investigative units uh, within the Seattle Police Department, and they will also be working closely with the King County Prosecutor's Office. And this co-location is important uh, to ensure that survivors of crime are met with a trauma-informed, survivor-centered response early on in the criminal investigation process. Um, their voices and their wishes are heard at all stages of the investigation and the criminal proceedings and their rights uh, as crime survivors are protected. Next slide. Uh, as previously mentioned, Crime Survivor Services is really two programs. So the first program is the Victim Support Team. Uh, this is made up of roughly 60 community volunteers that uh, provides a mobile trauma response, um, advocacy and crisis intervention. Uh, the VST volunteer teams respond primarily on the weekends to domestic violence calls and sexual assault crime scenes. And this is at the request of patrol officers. Uh, they provide a response that meets the emergency needs of these crime survivors following the traumatic event. BST was designed to address this gap in services that occur primarily on the weekends when domestic violence calls are happening the most frequently, and then also community services are hardest to access during that time as well. What they provide is transportation. They help locate emergency shelters. Uh, they can provide some emergency services such as food and baby needs and clothing. 
and they do um, extensive community resource referral, really providing that bridge to more sustainable community services. Uh, they also spend quite a bit of time answering questions uh, and helping to navigate the criminal justice system and offer extensive safety planning as well. Uh, and then we have a staff advocate during the week who provides case management to address the survivor's basic needs, as well as coordination across multiple systems. Uh, next slide. And then our second program are the Crime Victim Advocates, and we have nine um, staff who have come over from SPD. Uh, they are responsible for ensuring that the Washington State statutory obligations are met related to timely notifications to crime victims uh, and also upholding the Crime Victims Bill of Rights. All of the advocates are responsible for providing the required uh, services to crime survivors, ensuring that the statutory obligations are met, as I said, um, and they accompany victims to defense interviews and court hearings and speak on behalf of the victims when asked to do so. So they are often the ones that are reading the victim impact statement um, on behalf of that victim while in court. These advocates provide ongoing safety planning for survivors of coercive control through the length of the trial process, which as most of you know, are quite extensive, especially this past year with the courts being closed. Um, they also assist with mitigating the impact of the crime, such as helping uh, to file crime victims compensation forms um, and claims and assisting with bereavement arrangements with family members of homicide victims. They also advocate on behalf of the survivors for workplace and tenants rights uh, and assisting with securing alternate care for providers of elder abuse survivors as well as connecting um, crime survivors with restorative healing services and or counseling. And that is it for me. Any questions? Yeah, I have, so, I have a question about the um, yeah. volunteer program yes. of the safety volunteers. Um, has there been an assessment of whether or not that um, that number of volunteers uh, has the capacity to meet the need. Um, it, it just is numbers of people. And then also an assessment of whether or not um, the the cohort of volunteers, uh, given its, um, its demographic makeup is capable of uh, delivering culturally relevant uh, survivor services. Um, I'm just I'm concerned about uh, relying on um, on a volunteer um, cohort, um, and I know because the city in in instances where the city wants a different different representation, um, uh, typically this is for community engagement processes, not not working to volunteer in this fa fashion. But we've provided. Uh, stipends uh, out of recognition that you get a different uh, population of people to participate because not everybody um, that you want to participate can can afford to volunteer. And so I'm just wondering if that sort of analysis has been done with this particular volunteer cohort. I just want to make sure that the people who, um, I mean, I obviously value um, everybody's uh, um, service, their public service as a volunteer, but I'll, I also want to make sure that um, the the, dem the demographic composition of that volunteer cohort is able to um, deliver culturally relevant services. Sure. Um, thank you. You asked a couple of questions, and I want to make sure that I answer all of them. Um, the first one was whether we are really meeting the needs during that window of time. Um, I will say that our efforts are, as I stated earlier, really trying to bridge the gap in services. Um, and that can't be done with just our program. It really can't. Um, we are partnering with community programs that do serve specific populations. We are really trying to connect them to services that are more sustainable. Um, it is that emergency response. And so, um, and then it also is by nature, um, at the discretion of the patrol officers to utilize our services. And so the quick answer is yes, or the quick answer is no, we probably are not meeting the um, 
uh, the needs of everyone who could utilize those those services on the weekends. Um, and so we're always trying to increase our utilization by um, going to roll call trainings to uh, promote the use of the program with patrol officers because it is that discretion. Um, and and so we're, we're working to increase that. And I will say too, over the last year, the volunteers have been furloughed. Um, because of the restrictions, um, the public health restrictions. So we haven't been able to get the volunteers in the field. So there's been huge gaps in services there that we're really trying to figure out how to bring them back quickly um, and be more responsive. Uh, the other part you mentioned is just um, what are we doing to make sure that we are representational in the communities that we're serving? And, um, you know, that is always something that we're working towards. Um, I can recognize that we, we are not currently representational um, as a volunteer pool of about 60 community volunteers, but that is a priority of ours. We are using the RSGI toolkit to ensure, um, you know, with the, that the city provides to ensure that we are working with the different community groups that we're referring to, as well as the communities that we're that we're serving, um, to identify, you know, how we can greater, you know, provide additional diversity and representation on our volunteer team. Um, but that said, uh, we are just one one really um, point in a much broader network of service providers um, and so they can't they can't do it all um, it is really really important that we do uh, continue to collaborate and partner with those community programs and that i do support those community programs uh you know receiving funding <laughs> I think you bring up an interesting point though. We'll take it back to our department. I think with uh, the transfer over of this unit into HSD and you know HSD uh, uh, race and social justice initiative is very much at the forefront of the work that we're doing and our um, staff uh, are extremely diverse and we do have direct services uh, throughout the whole department as well. And so, um, you know, process improvement, especially making sure that we're grounded in community and lifting um, you know, uh, our representation is really important to us. And so we'll definitely um, take your feedback uh, into into um, our work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then one other question um, that, you know, your, your answer uh, to my first question jogged for me. How do we, how would we, if we wanted to, um, analyze um, SPD's voluntary um, use of the victim advocates um if if there is a is uh, is a feeling that um that the, perhaps they're not being um deployed um as often as they they can be um and that's anecdotal is there is there data that we could seek to either confirm or or dispute that um, I think that the utilization of our program is something that I've worked on for many years. Um, I will say that where we are possibly seeing um, a reduction in use of calling us out on scene, um, we're trying to close gaps in other ways. So the benefit of having this partnership and access to Seattle Police Department and their records is that we can do a deeper dive on um, calls that we're not getting called to on scene. And for instance, like out of custody cases where we're gonna see that they're not gonna get assigned a detective or that they're not gonna get assigned a system-based advocate, we're gonna try to fill that gap later on, maybe even just the next day by reaching out to that survivor of that crime and um, providing those services otherwise. So we're really trying to get more creative about how we can reach out to folks um, who need our services that are not being called out to the scene by the, with the volunteers on the weekend. And that's where our staff advocate really comes in. Thank you. So we could, uh we could request information uh, from HSD about the the number of times that you went out um, both with um, the officer and times that you didn't go out with, but you followed up the next day. And we, we could, that that is a, a report that, that we could fill. Yes, I do keep that information, yeah. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm.
I'm not seeing any other questions or hands. Is that the conclusion of, of the report? It is. Great. Um, I, I guess just one other question, Tanya. We had talked about um, the fact that you are working on finalizing an MOU with uh, the Seattle Police Department. Can you, um, just so folks understand the complexity associated um, with this transfer, can you talk a little bit about the areas that this MOU is going to cover? Yes, Dana can speak I, to that. I can definitely. Right. So with this transition, um, an interdepartmental agreement was created, and this defines the coordination and also outlines matters related to business requirements and specific job duties of each employee. So it establishes a plan for ongoing case assignments for the staff, um, the use of equipment, the continued access to secure law enforcement facilities, um, secure databases, and police records. So this is um, currently now being routed for signatures. Great. All right. <laughs> That's great news. Uh, I've been, I've been check, checking in on the on the status of that a little bit here and there. And last time, I, I did not know that you were at the stage. So that's that's um, good news to to receive um, in a committee briefing. So thank you again. Um, I'm not hearing or seeing any other uh, questions or comments, no virtual raised hands, uh, and no actual raised hands. So um, really appreciate your flexibility uh, with our long agenda, appreciate all the work that you're doing. And um, uh, Council, or Council President Gonzalez, I'm seeing you're coming on screen, are you coming on screen to say, 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 say hello and goodbye, or do you have a question? <laughs> No, I was just, um, I also wanted to express my, my uh, deep appreciation and gratitude to the team for um, a good uh, presentation. Um, I was taking lots of notes and um, and really appreciate, again, all of the hard work. This is a difficult um, space to work within, and um, I, I really appreciate the tenacity and the, the thoroughness of the team. So, so thank you all for that work. All right. Fantastic. Well, again, um, uh, your your time, your work, and your flexibility um, with our um, length of our agenda today. And um, the next Public Safety and Human Services Committee is scheduled for May 11th. And before we adjourn, if there are any comments from my colleagues or closing remarks, this is the time to make them. And if not, we are adjourned. Thank you. It is uh, 1227.